Ladies and gentlemen, good morning. Today's episode is brought to you by, wait for it, that's right, Black Rifle Coffee. As always, I'm going to surf over to blackriflecoffee.com and read to you what I see and the things that are interesting to me. The first thing I'm seeing, which is timely, is a gift, dad, a coffee subscription, which is pretty sweet. If your dad likes coffee and you're looking for a last minute gift, you could totally turn this on before Father's Day. It's probably not going to show up before Father's Day, but you could turn it on before then. Then they still have the boot campaign going on, which I've talked about before. Instead of me trying to explain what it is and what it does, I highly recommend you just go to the site. It's on their rotating banner up top. And they're doing this Bass Cat Boat giveaway thing still or again. And I don't know much about Bass Cat Boats because um, I don't really fish that much. But it's a fully rigged and custom wrap Bass Cat Cougar with a whole lot more. I feel like that's probably a big deal. I just don't know. And if none of those things suit your fancy... Just go to the website and you could order coffee, ground, whole, whatever you want, apparel, things to make coffee in, things to drink coffee out of, t-shirts, all sorts of stuff. BlackRifleCoffee.com. My guest today is Matt Higgins. Man, what a story this individual has. Started his life, New York, Queens to be specific, in what could only be described as abject poverty. And I'll leave it at that because he talks about it quite a bit. Drops out of high school, gets a GED, puts himself into law school at night, becomes a press secretary for Rudy Giuliani, oversaw the reconstruction of the 9-11 memorial, went into business as an entrepreneur, worked with the Jets, uh, was a guest on Shark Tank. He's an executive fellow at the Harvard Business School and has a new book out called Burn the Boats. Toss Plan B Overboard and Unleash Your Full Potential. And the concept is exactly what it says on the book. So how about we get into this? Episode number 290 with Matt Higgins. Let's burn the boats. Here we go. Okay, got the red smoke. Fire. Gun run. North and south. West of the smoke. West of the smoke. Okay, copy. West of the smoke. I'm looking at danger close now. Oh, what a minute. Give it to me. I need it. Get cleared hot. Copy, cleared hot. I, I can't count the number of times people like, oh, you were a team guy? Do you know Bob? I know. It's probably pretty annoying. I'm trying not to do that to you. It's I, just, not I, have, I have a hi hierarchy of annoyingness about in that area. <laughs> like, do you remember you know, Chuck McGraw? Well, another guy at Bud's, yeah. right? I'm, I'm, I'm going to try not to do that. Well, the community is small but large. You know the people really well that you work directly with, and you don't know anybody one building over. Even though it's the same pipeline, same origin story, it's just, I don't know. Be like being in a big, huge skyscraper, but you only work on one floor. Like you don't go visit everybody on every single floor. Right. Well, yeah. I'll try not to fanboy you with random names. Okay, fair enough. <laughs> you don't live in New York anymore, do you? Ish. You know, I uh, Jersey. No, yeah, ish. upstate. Yeah, yeah. No, you know, <laughs> like so. <laughs> so I have an apartment in the city okay. at the moment, renting it out. But uh, business is in the city. My office is in the city. But I live in New Jersey. But having grown up in New York, I have to hesitate saying that publicly because you know everyone around me in, in in New York will say, "How could you?" Yeah, I actually really like New York. I had not been there. I actually had not been to New York until well post nine eleven. The early to mid 2000s and uh i could not live in that type of environment i don't like the difficulty seeing the sky sometimes yeah we do have a problem with that well recently too that was a different issue to right, right 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 <laughs> i'm yeah. just talking straight looking but, up and but it's, we have a big we have a big river for you if you have two that's true so you could go down those and they're but, really clean right oh yeah it? no you could drink right from it to be <laughs> honest although i do go fishing in it what would happen if you drank directly from that water? I haven't tried it, but I but I but fishing is pretty amazing. You go for bass; they're monsters. Really? Yeah, it's all the uh, all the uh, radioactivity makes them uh, of course enormous. Of course, right? So you don't yeah. eat them, but you do brag about them. Okay, fair enough. On Instagram, I can appreciate why people would love the hustle and bustle of that. I just was exposed to it. I think later in life, and I get I get anxious being that just <laughs> compressed in there, especially juxtaposing that with where I live now, where. There's yeah, just over a million people. I don't even know how many square miles Montana is, but let's just say the population density is a lot less than New York. It's beautiful out here. I, yeah. I'm I am um, I'm glad I came of age in it because I feel like if you can tolerate that and thrive, then you could be anywhere. But I probably am happier in cities uh, where I allow for a little more uh, indulgence. I love going to Europe. Mm -hmm. I have a lot of business in Europe. 
um, I love it, you know, Aspen and Austin and all these great cities, but you know, it definitely is a grind. I'm not going to pretend. When you're yeah. there, we like to purport that it's not, you know. If you had to pick one of those cities or other ones that you've been, if you could only pick one, where would you go? London. Really? Yeah, really like London. I, I enjoy being in Like Europe. London, London proper yeah. or like Proximal? Yeah, no, London proper. Okay. I still want to be in a city. I want to I want to have my second home somewhere around here, uh, but I want to be in the city. Uh, I like being on the water as well. But if, if you told me I have to pick one place, probably London. Really? Yeah. I've spent a little time there. I enjoyed it. Uh, haven't been back in a long, long time. Yeah. No. It's. But what about uh, Australia? Uh, you you spent time there as well. I right? have. I, well, I was there for a little bit in January, and I've gone. Uh, Barclays took me through a speaking kind of tour down there for about a week. Pre-COVID, so about three years ago. I've enjoyed every single time I've been down there. I went down there for a few times actually working for CrossFit, uh, like Sydney, Melbourne, Perth, like major areas. I have not gotten any time to actually explore outside of that, but it's awesome. Yeah, I um, I, I have a philosophy wherever I, I go. I'm, I try to lower the bar to travel in case today is the last day. So I've been in Australia once. I was there for 36 hours. And then uh, thought it was close to China, like an American doesn't look at the map. I was like, oh, I have to be in Shanghai. Australia's They're only there. like five inches apart. On the yeah, map. that's what Depending I said. Depending on scale. Right. I didn't do the research. <laughs> but but uh, I know you love uh, coffee, and I'm a big investor in uh, an Australian coffee concept as well. So Really? Yeah. That's yeah, awesome. Yeah. No, I. Uh, it's called Bluestone Lane. My business partner in the coffee shop up here spent, uh, he took a, actually, I'll, I'll leave his business aspect out of it. He was involved in taking a company public in Australia. He raves about the coffee scene there, um, the, like the bespoke coffee shops, and the, basically you're gonna you're gonna have like a, le- a leather aproned waxed mustache uh, barista aficionado like cranking you out some good stuff. The opposite of Starbucks is actually yeah, the short way I've, to say that. <laughs> my 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 my, uh, my 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 partner in Bluestone Lane is from Melbourne. He was an athlete. He became a banker, you know, and just hated the drudgery of being a banker. And when he was in New York, lonely, was saying, "I got to bring in Melbourne coffee culture yeah. to New York." And uh, coffee is amazing, I have to say. Sometimes, I'm like, I don't totally get it. <laughs> so I was only there thirty six hours, but yeah. but the coffee's fantastic. I wasn't into coffee when I was there, except for this last trip. But we were so exhausted, I would have, I mean. I would have drank coffee out of homeless guy's ass crack. I was just like, I need to stay awake. You couldn't be more vivid than that, by the way. Yeah, I don't know why that particular <laughs> image came to me, but that's how... Well, it shows how committed. I was going to say, that's the, where the need was for me. Like, you know, maybe I would have waited till it filtered through like the concrete on the ground and picked it up with a straw, but yeah. Have you been to New Zealand? I have not. That's a gap. Have you? I have. And so if you were to ask me the same one, I had asked you the same question. I might actually land on New Zealand. Now, I've only seen the Southern Island, which is where they filmed Lord of the Rings. I would like to clarify. You had asked me a city, though. That's true. That is true. You didn't say a paradise that I could pick. (sighs) That is true. But you hadn't been to New Zealand, so I don't think you would have come up with that answer. (laughs) I just presume there isn't a city that qualifies for this question. Yeah. So back to you. What city, if you had to be in a city where you couldn't see the sky or breathe easily? I don't know. I would. Go, I don't know if I would go city. I'd probably go smaller. I'd probably go like town. Okay. But, and I don't know where the break is between those two. But that southern island of New Zealand was the single most beautiful place I've ever been. And there's a reason why they filmed Lord of the Rings there. And you can basically, well, you can't really drive through exactly where they filmed the movie, but you can see it in the distance, and it looks awesome. I've never had more lamb and red wine in my entire life. I had heartburn for so long. I didn't. I wasn't even really a wine person, and they just kept bringing out these amazing meals. I'm like, this is the best wine I've ever had. Just keep it coming and wake up like, oh, I'm dying. How long were you there for? Over two weeks. It was, a, it was an appropriate amount of time to kind of just cruise around. We had a vehicle and just kind of circumnavigated that uh, South Island. It was great. I was just in um, Singapore, and I was looking at the map. I'm like, I think I'm kind of close to New Zealand. Can I, can I, can I, we ran out of time. Let me generally. I, I consider close anything within eight hours. I think you are. I actually think that I've been to Singapore many times too, and I've heard the expats from Australia and from the U.S. talking about going back and forth as like the destination location. Right. I kept meeting people from Australia yeah. and New Zealand. I figured it's got to be close. Yeah. Closer than we are now. <laughs> exactly. I can tell you that much. Where'd you grow up originally? So I grew up in uh, Queens, New York. Yep. So lifelong New Yorker. I uh, grew up uh, in, uh, we can get into it, grew up in dirt poverty, hawking flowers on street corners as a kid and scraping gum under McDonald's. And, like straight up selling flowers on the street corner Yeah, like legit. Cash. Yeah, like legit. Like uh, you know, Where'd you get the flowers from? 
That's a good point from the guy that I eventually would want to take his job because he's the guy who was, <laughs> I was like, that's what I learned all about capitalism. It's much better to be the guy who gets the flowers, uh, but there would be these random, you know, uh, hustlers. I, well, I'll give you the hustling job. So that was one job, you know, the guy who would knock on your window on Mother's Day and guilt you, or, or uh, but also um, I would stand on line for uh, ticket scalpers. So that you could buy tickets for them, like with the signs where you're walking through, like the crowds. Yeah, I was before the sign in the supply okay. chain. I was the one who procured you know, okay. on behalf of the hustler, the middleman, if yeah. you will, who wasn't robbing people. He was enterprising. That was yeah. before StubHub came and put him out of business, kind of like pre AI. <laughs> you know yeah. what I mean? So I did that job. So everything was about honestly hustling. I had a disabled parent uh, who got progressively worse over time. She actually died from obesity, which is interesting because she wouldn't be dead today with all the uh, shots. How so, old was she? When she died, she was 55. But uh, So health conditions associated with obesity? Yeah, a Diabetes? little. Diabetes? Uh, probably a, a combination of, of health issues and self-destruction from a life of poverty and abuse that only became clear in hindsight. But there were a lot of um, steps she probably could have taken that may have made a difference. But regardless, she had health issues. And by the time she died, she was uh, f- over 400 pounds. How'd she find her way to New York? <sighs> born, born here. You okay. know, when you when you when you're born in poverty, you tend to stay within a nucleus uh, or not a not a nucleus. A radius. Some people do. I mean, you, yeah, you I got out. That. I was going to say you mm. are literally sitting here as the abject opposite of that mold. Yep. So yeah. she came from. Okay, she kind of came from. A, do you know the? Well, I'm sure. I'm assuming you do the lineage of your family. Where do they originate from? They're um, Irish and Italian. My mother was Italian, and uh, she, how many generations prior to your mother? Um, coming to the U.S.? Yeah. Uh, hers was, I think, two generations. Okay. On the Irish side, they came over in like 1880, you know, uh, but on her side a little bit later. But, um, yeah, no, so we just, I grew up on government cheese. I mean, like, real poor. You know, everyone, those words lose their meaning, so I like to give nuggets like you did with the homeless ass a second ago, so I'm yeah. trying to give a little color. My, mine was a brick of government cheese. And like so, a legitimate brick. Like a legitimate brick. It's I, I keep it on my desk as a memento, and it's also a good story for podcasts, but... It says, uh, courtesy of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. Does it really? Yeah, because in the 80s, there was a program to subsidize farmers, and they would buy their cheese. And it actually tasted pretty good. Anybody, It shows up in songs with rappers. Yeah. For a while, I was going to name my fund Government Cheese, you know, a little belligerent. Didn't do that. Um, I think it was a good call that you skipped that. Really? You don't like that? There was a target name market it. for it, for sure, but I think it would have been a swing and miss with a lot. <laughs> <laughs> the next time homeless ass coffee from the homeless ass <laughs> I mean let's let's run that by some marketing yeah, yeah, consultants we'll A, we'll a B test that <laughs> yeah for sure but so. definitely we might need to ABC test that one yeah. <laughs> so. but uh so and then I um, I made this radical decision which I'm talking about in my book and talk about a lot in life talk about when I talk to kids who are going through something and and that was to uh, drop out of high school when I was 16 years old why did you make that decision so um, the truth of the matter is when you are parentified as a child, uh, you are confused by it, you are resentful of it, but you also begin to take on the hero narrative, I think subconsciously. So all those things were happening to me. I was being conditioned as the hero child. I, I was very empathetic. You know, my brothers skipped town and as soon as they could, but I was the empathetic little one. And I was taking care of my mother, but I was very aware that it was a dysfunctional dynamic that I was being put in this situation. And so I wanted to honor the obligation and get the hell out. Never had a girl over, never had a friend over for a decade, lived in, lived in squalor. And so I came up with a hack that was actually inspired by my mother. I told you she was a product of abuse, mm-hmm. incredibly smart, but had no education. And so I watched her uh, divorce my father, clean floors for Catholic charities, that was her job for senior citizens, but get a GED. And I remember when she said, you know, I'm, I'm going to I'm gonna go back, get an education. She got her GED and enrolled in college um, when she was 38, whatever. So I'm a little boy and I'm watching this progression. And I'm becoming increasingly frustrated that nobody gives a shit. Like nobody cares. Like we're going to emergency rooms. I'm pretending that I have spinal meningitis as a way to, I'm like, my neck is really sore so we can bypass. There's all these hacks, right? But I'm like, nobody ever intervenes. And at the sort of brink of my desperation, I, I had this epiphany, which is, if I were to drop out of high school, I could go from making three seventy five at McDonald's to a high school student and get paid like a high school student. I'd see these little ads, and I'm like, what the hell is it about being a high school, a college kid that gets you paid $8 an hour? That was it. And so I started researching the hack. At what age did you realize it was dysfunctional? 
This one's always hard for me to say. I don't think I've talked about this. Um, when my mother told me she was contemplating suicide when I was 11 years old, she was going through a lot of stuff. I'm going to drop that out very quick so I can get through it. That's, but, that's heavy. Yeah, that was heavy. And, you know, she just was so desperate. And, you know, when some, something, something, that was a moment where something was lost, like something was broken, right? Like, you know, because as a kid, you're looking to be safe. You're trying to make sense of it. Yeah. But she had told me around that time she had been through something and she's like, you know, what if, um, what if mommy wasn't here anymore? And you're trying to read those words. Like, what is, what is mommy, where are you going to be? You yeah, know, you're looking at that through the lens of an 11 year old's processing ability. Right. And I had just been in a bus accident. This is why I remember this very clearly. I'd just been in a bus accident, had stitches. So, you know, as a kid, you remember. It was like pretty, a school bus accident? Yeah, school bus. I got hit by a truck. Um, fuck. Yeah, fuck. I know. I know. <laughs> Shit, you're, we're getting to it hard fast. <laughs> it's like, uh, I want to go back to the lamb in New Zealand and the totally. heartburn. So I recommend the Pinot. Yeah, off please. The, uh, southern yes. slopes. <laughs> uh, around other, other cities that I was talking about. Uh, Chamonix is very beautiful. <laughs> like, so, mom in the. So, uh, so she. Um, I had been in a bus accident. I had stitches. I think I had seven stitches in my head. So I remember this very vividly because while I had the stitches, she had told me that the night before. And the next day I was standing by the ocean, looking out into the ocean and thinking like, I want to be there. I don't want to be here anymore. You know, like, so something, so that was a moment of a break. Now on a positive note, this sounds so grim, um, it really triggered a defiance of like, no. This is not natural. It's not normal. And this will not define me. And th that was the moment that I started saying, like, I need a way out. I need to reconcile taking care of her, doing right. But at the same time, I need to get the hell out of here. Man. I didn't mean to drop that on you. No, but, I mean, you're not alone in people that deal with that. Yeah. That break, it, you know, it. it no, I don't believe the world is really binary at all, but it really does put people in two different directions. You can do something with that, or you can be destroyed by that. I I agree. I had um. I love that you said that because you know that that was sort of like the the, the seismic break, right? But there are other moments when you gain momentum and you try to figure things out. We would have these. We were very close too, so we'd have these conversations. And she was becoming increasingly depressed while I was becoming increasingly defiant. And I remember there was a, another moment where I really decided to take custody of things, take it into my own hands, and about dropping out, just, I'm gonna figure this out. And uh, I remember saying to her, she was she was complaining about just things not working out for us. I said, you know, mom, I don't wanna see the world as a place where we are destined to be victimized. So from now on, I've decided that things no longer happen to me, I happen to things. And mm -hmm. she's like, well, it's easy for you to say when you're not dying. I said, we're all dying. I don't." you don't have an end date. Like, you know, at that point, it was like the trials of Job. Every bad thing was happening, but nothing in particular. Yeah. But I do remember that very clearly. No bullshit. I said that to her sitting at the table. I said, from now on, I happen to things. Things don't happen to me. And I've actually never changed. I hadn't read Man's Search for Meaning yet, right? Like these incredible books that talk about the survivor mentality. But that was the moment where I really began to take custody and came up with this crazy plan for which everyone said, you're out of your mind. Yeah, you know, those are some of the best plans. They are, they are the best plans. And and looking back, if you go to your teacher who's entirely vested in the system and their job is to get you to graduate school and you're like, I have a hack, I'm actually going to get, um, get drop out at 16 and that's going to enable me to get a GED and I get a better paying job. One, you know, you're defying everything they've worked for. But two, they don't have context just how desperate your situation is. I think if anybody that I had spoken to back then had seen the fact that I was sleeping on a dog-worn mattress in a roach motel with a mother who literally cried all night long, I used to wrap a towel around my head so I could hear through the fibers. You know what I mean? So I could be cognizant but try to have some peace. If somebody had seen that as an adult, they would have been like, this is probably a good idea. This is not a bad idea, Matt. <laughs> like, you might want to get out of here as soon as possible, and it seems like a pretty good hack. I would hope that they would think that, but I find a lot of people, if you are undermining their value system and where they have arrived at in life, and you seem to find value elsewhere, they take it as like an assault against their values. They really do. They can't accept that maybe you have value something more or you want something different than what they want because of what they have invested in their time. It's a tough one. It's also very provoking. So there's different contexts, right? So that's a context where somebody's responsible for the official wisdom or conventional wisdom. Mm -hmm. Then there's the context of somebody who doesn't want to be threatened that they should be doing more with their lives. And so you deciding to break convention is very threatening, very uncomfortable. But for whatever reason, that was the pressure. And then I came up with the second epiphany, which has shaped my entire career and my life, which is, huh, 
I'm not going to be able to withstand these interventions, whether it be the police picking me up at McDonald's or the lectures. Remember, I was an intelligent kid. I manifested as like, I made sure I covered everything up. So I had my Jordache jeans back at the time. You wouldn't really know. Yeah. So I was like, I need to self-sabotage. I need to burn the boats. I need to put myself in a position where um, the school writes me off. And that's when I decided I would fail every single class. So I was unredeemable, even to myself and sit in the same uh, homeroom with the kids with the beepers, you know, making very different career choices. And that's what I did. I failed every single thing except for typing, no bullshit, because I thought that was useful. Single, I've said this so many times on the podcast, it's the single most useful class that I took in high school. Really? That's amazing. I actually did not know that. I've listened I listened to a couple episodes, but every I- Every day. Really? It's, I feel that I type, we should do a type off, by the way, because no one will compete with me. Everyone's, God, everyone's afraid. I hate to admit this, before you showed up, Michael's gonna be so happy. I'm sitting here, I was forget what I was doing on my computer, and I hear him over there just I'm like, like, what the hell are you doing? He's like, oh, I'm doing a typing competition <laughs> software. I'm at ninety four words a minute. I'm like, Shut really? Up. That's yeah. what he said. Oh, that's actually a little intimidating. I mean I I I, I know Nothing I'm I know I'm ninety words a minute. Really? I mean <laughs> that's amazing. Actually, you know what? I'll give him that one. If people want to be intimidated by how, Michael. How about admire Ty- Michael? Can we at least give him that? I mean, ninety four. Yeah, that's on. that's now now. How long did he? I don't sustain like it when the, he has allies in here. How long did he sustain the effort? <laughs> Fuck, was, I don't know. It was like a two sentence little blurb. Mm, I it lifted, wasn't super long. I lifted my head up from what he was from what I was doing because of the velocity. I heard the fingers. Okay, that's fair. Dangling on the keys. I'm like, whoa. Yeah, no, I, I I say that it really is the most useful skill, and that was the one Every I locked day. in. I was like, I'm gonna, I'm gonna yeah. I can do something with it. And to this day, I'm now I'm afraid. I was gonna say higher, but I'm like, I can type at least 85 because Michael's in the room. Like, <laughs> if you think about the most, I look back often. I, I barely scrape by high school. It's the uh, highest level of education that I have, and I look back because I have uh, two children now who are out of high school. My daughter just became a sophomore. They Congratulations! They finished. I saw that. It was wild. It was. I was like. My daughter, my middle son graduates high school, and then my daughter turns into a, a sophomore the next year. And I'm looking back at the education system I went through. Like I understand the where it, it likely comes from from the general education. You know, hit, like I, I am a fan of history. Like history and creative writing were the two courses or classes that I, I kind of liked the most. They just rang true to me. The high level math, man. Thank God they let us bring scientific calculators in there that I had already preloaded the answers to the test on and we're just pulling up like it was a formula. <laughs> but Such but, a waste, right? Well, I've never – not only have I never really used those skills, if I've needed to, I can now go to YouTube or point my camera on my phone at it. And not only will it give me the answer, it will show me how it was done. By the way, to this point, my wife, who might as well be like a prepper, like she can do anything, yeah. like a licensed contractor architect, she would debate this point with you right now. And she, all the time when I bring up, what the hell is the Pythagorean theorem yeah. anyway? Like, I don't use that. She's like, I'll show you. I'm like, you mean the, it does have a point? It has a point, but I think if you're an engineer, it has a much more valid daily point Fair. than knuckleheads like us walking around. Because okay. you and I both know how to find people who know what the Pythagorean theorem is. I always say that. I don't, I, 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 <laughs> we could talk about this, but I always meet some of the guys you know, transitioning from the military, right? And they don't know what they don't know or yeah. don't know what they need to know. And they're always insecure about like math and Excel. I was like, do you really think you want to be the guy who excels at Excel? No. Do you think that guy's in charge? I was like, I don't even know how to use Excel. And I'm proud of it. <laughs> Like to if, navigate this world without it. If I was coming out, I never did a resume coming out of the military because I was kind of double. I was not kind of. I was exactly double dipping working for a CrossFit. I would probably put on there has no knowledge of the Microsoft Office suite and have been proud of that. You would have stood out. You would have stood. <laughs> <laughs> they would have been like, "So what's this?" I'm like, "That don't hire me for that job." But Michael would have put on 94 words a minute. Oh, dude. What else? You probably would have like some Adobe qualification. Yeah. I don't know about my max is like 110. See now you're just trying to make people. He's just feel a braggadocious bad. asshole over there. <laughs> but is that? But is that? But but do you need amphetamines to do that? Because that doesn't count. Uh, no, I can do it off of caffeine. Okay. Yeah. Oh, by the way, I bought this. I, I I'm so excited because I want you to like mentor me on how to use this. Like I am not a dipper, but that is essentially a coffee grind yeah, seen version yeah. of dip. So it's the same thing. Um, I had a horrendous. I tried dip. I tried wintergreen Kodiak Skull. No, no, Skull's a different brand. Wintergreen Kodiak. When I was in high school, one time I was a catcher on the baseball team, and the senior uh, freshman, the senior comes up to me and goes, here you go, you want to try some of this? I'm like, okay, jam it in there. I had braces. 
<laughs> um, let's just say it took me a couple days to get the taste of that wintergreen out of my mouth, and that cured me for any desire to ever dip again. So I'm not an expert at anything that comes in a can like that, but I think it's supposed to be a better version or a less damaging, dangerous version than the nicotine. Because, you know, in dip, that there's like fiberglass in there. It has to irritate the inside of your lips so it can actually get into your, your bloodstream. And also, your face is going to eat itself. And, and you got mouth cancer. Hundred percent. Years later, so this I, is this is the dip without the mouth cancer. I believe so. For those playing along at home, I stopped by uh, shop a little while ago and was so excited to find this. Yeah, I'm gonna I'm gonna try it out. I didn't actually know that we uh, sold that until you I do. saw it on the shelf. I, I, I was I was particularly very excited. <laughs> I was like, "What the fuck is this?" Like, yeah. You know. Have you ever tried that stuff, Michael? Uh, no. I think though it's similar. You know what Zin is? Z Y N. Yeah. No. yeah, those are the nicotine. Yeah. straight nicotine little pouches. It's supposed to be better than actual dip because yeah. it's not cutting your lip or whatever. Mm. Michael just goes pure Colombian cocaine. That's how he's over there. Yeah, just well, that's, <laughs> that's, that explains the <laughs> typing, <laughs> right? One ten. <laughs> see, WPM. I see. I would pass a drug test and still type ninety-seven words a yeah. minute just to be clear. Michael, well, I mean, he's he's enhanced. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Not from a physical perspective, obviously, but whatever, whatever it takes. <laughs> PEDs. How many people did you bounce your idea of ejecting from high school off of? Like, did you tell your mom? Did you tell your friends? I, I told my mom, actually. And this is the the, 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 the one gift that she really gave me. I died destitute, obviously. But um, she was like, that sounds like a great plan. She's like, you're way too smart for that place anyway. Like, my, my mother always had, uh, maybe this is part of the hero thing, uh, but always had a, um, a, a limitless belief that I could pull off any radical plan. So there wasn't a bit of pushback. And then I, I didn't really have a, a friend group at the time or, or any mentors or any family. So, so it was just my plan. And, uh, you know, you always try to keep yourself honest. Like, how much of this is nonsense? How much of this is reconstructed? Like, it was 100% a conscious choice. Like, I had gone from, uh, you know, a special little middle high school uh, all the way to college. And it just, it just dropped like a bomb. What year were you in high school when you bombed out? Or ejected it. I think ejected I, is a better term because it was it was your choice whether you actually failed out or yeah. That's why I yeah. always I always want to be very clear because it yeah. would be easier to have this narrative like oh you were a kid gone wrong like no it wasn't no, it was a choice I know exactly what I was doing I was not gonna you know it was this kid and it was a it was it's interesting it's it's in a neighborhood that otherwise is prosperous surrounding it but but where I grew up it was not at all right subsidized apartments and yeah. kids died and things like that so um, it was 1991 was when I dropped when I dropped out what. At that time when you had dropped out, when you were forward looking as a young man, what was your definition of success at that point? Like, what did you, when you had it in your mind's eye of, I'm going to arrive at this particular spot, what did that look like for you then? For me, it was and remains autonomy. I felt very much, I couldn't stand how much uh, I had to bite my tongue, you know, how much I. Yeah just didn't have any power to me money uh, was about was about autonomy and freedom so that i didn't have any I, you know i had visions of politics probably feeling like uh, this again the hero idea right and this romanticized version of politics but really mostly it was just about freedom that nobody could dictate my circumstances like from the time i was a little kid it was looking past the boss to the point where i had the money and the independence and i always had a pretty good sense that um that i had it in me this wasn't something that I discovered. I, I, I don't nature versus nurture. I'm not sure where that came from, but I always knew that I didn't necessarily belong here, and hmm. that it wasn't going to dictate my circumstances. What was your relationship like with money at that age? How did, how did you view money? Was it you need enough to survive? Did you have any long term thoughts about money? Just coming from that that level of poverty, I'm just fascinated what it would like. Yeah, I, I uh, it was uh, it was about. Um, First about uh, you know substance right like survival just, survival so yeah. I, we literally made nothing but for me money became so this is sixteen years old right um, I guess at that point I was making five dollars an hour at a deli uh, working I used to work overnights at a deli carry my 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 butterfly knife you know to get home uh, in one piece this is where what also started happening the circumstances of survival were such a departure from the average situation that you start realizing, well, clearly education is not set up for me. If I'm working overnight at a deli and I'm carrying my knife just to get home and I'm dealing with a mother who is moaning all night, so clearly I'm not sleeping, where's the bespoke program for me, right? Like, yeah. So once I started to realize, like, well, nothing is set up. I mean, we used to take a bus to a church an hour away to get boxes of food because she was embarrassed. You know, I was like, don't we have churches? And the churches seem to be everywhere. So it was like, that was the, you know, the big part. But money for me represented 
what would it take for me to fulfill my obligation in life, take care of my parent, but at the same time be selfish? Because I was acutely aware that um, not being selfish during these formative years was really going to mess my head up. And I would have these honest conversations. I was like, you want me to hook up with a girl? Like, you want me to drink a 40 in a park? (laughs) You know, like, these are the things, like, you don't want me to be a caretaker. And I do think that's where a degree of mental illness and poverty can get in the way as a parent figure. Because it took me a long time to understand, like, me as a parent now, the last thing in the world I want is for my children to take care of me in any possible way. So my, my, my relationship was such a distortion. But money represented me, the distance between where I was and what it would take to both get her an apartment and for me to live on my own. Like that's what money represents. Again, that was the early formation of freedom. Yeah. And I achieved it and we can we can get into the story a bit, but you know, a lot of things collided at the exact same moment in those uh, early years. So what was your first move once you were done with high school? So went to high school. I I had to return my books, by the way. This is the it's <laughs> this is the worst part. This is the <laughs> academic version of the walk of shame. So I had to bring my um my, my book's back, and I walked into my science class. His name was Mr. Rosenthal. It's now embedded in my brain. And, and you know, I go, I'm like, hey, excuse me. He's like, what's this? And I'm like, this is my textbook's not open. <laughs> you know, no damage. I'm like, ha. Huh. And he doesn't miss a beat. And he, and he goes, you're dropping out? So yeah, he goes, and he looks at the class, he goes, Higgins, what a waste. And he's like, I'll see you at McDonald's. He was like a tough, wise ass. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, all the kids are laughing like, oh, man. And, and I'm Irish. I'm all red. I'm about to pass out. This is already a hard decision, you know. Like, and uh, and uh, I walk to the door. Everyone's laughing. I'm like, this is the bottom, right? And I, before I walk out, no bullshit. And I said, you know, Mr. Rosenthal, if you see me in McDonald's, it's because I own it. And then I, now you hear all the kids like, oh snap, are you going to take Sick that? Burn. Right, right. Now I pack my Marlboros, sit on the steps. No, it's interesting. It's <laughs> weird that you're allowed to be on the steps of your high school in the middle of the day. It kind of all hits you like like you want the freedom, but then you're like, oh, wait a second. Like now everyone's like, all right, Junior, you wanted this. And they sign, they transfer you to the auxiliary services for high schools, which is a way to not carry the dropout on their rolls. You go right across the street to the land of misfit toys. You got to clear the balance sheet. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> like, all right, fuck face, you're yeah, out. You know, we got to write this one off. You Let's and get you, him off our You books. and your sad mom. <laughs> yeah. can cure. So I said, I was spoken to Bud. I'm like, you yeah, know, he's probably right. Like, if you think about it, he's probably, you know, odds are in his favor. <laughs> and, yeah. then, and then the next, I think it was a couple of days later, I had to show up uh, for the GD program. And then suddenly it became very real. I was like, oh, wait, I was just kidding. Like, I, I, I have a lot of talent. You know, I got to, so I had to accelerate. Anyway, long story short, I show up on standby at um, Springfield Gardens High School, standby, Two weeks later, take the GED on standby. Take the SATs as well for good measure. You took the GED yeah, yeah, test yeah, two weeks yeah, after. Two weeks after, yeah. It's not exactly a hard test, to be perfectly honest. But I've actually heard that. Yeah. I heard you have like the barriers to that one. If you you kind of yeah. got a trip to get, I was gonna yeah. say, and and and, and I did my research prior. This is true too. We had a college night, and I showed up just to pressure test this. And and I, there was some good schools, and I was like, "Can I ask you a question? If somebody had a GD, you know, they supposedly they did really well with with you know, would you admit them?" And of course, everyone, of course, son, you know, we 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 believe in second chances. And yeah. technically, at the time, if you did well enough, you could translate your GD score to a GPA, and you could go anywhere in America. No, Practically, I mean. It, maybe you couldn't go to Harvard. You could certainly go to some of the best institutions with a GED. So wow. now I, I didn't need to aim that high. I just needed to get to City College. So I, I did it, took the GED, did well enough, enrolled in college at 16, and then never see Goodwill Hunting. You yeah. Know? So I went back to my One prom. One of my favorites. Yeah. So I went back to the prom with this beautiful girl, showed up at the prom. You went to back to your high school prom. Yep. Okay. I was like, I was like, Maximus is not done. Now I'm mixing my metaphors, right? Like, you know, like <laughs> I was like <laughs> That is a very large gap in yep, timeline. But, but you'll but see yeah. I pull them yeah. together. Yeah. And then I, I see my I see my teachers and uh, and I see Mr. Rosenthal and I was like, Yeah, you know, on the bay team now. You know, how do you like them apples? I didn't say that, but that's yeah. in my mind it was one of those moments, right? And I say that story because one, it made sense that they thought you know, you're not going to pull this out. But I was received like Maximus in that arena, you know, as like, wow, you've returned, right? Yeah. And everyone, the the slight contempt versus pity had transformed to begrudging respect. And in fact, my Spanish speech teacher at the time, who's a sweetheart, homeroom, homeroom teacher, she was getting her master's at the same college that I suddenly now was enrolled at. 
And so that story is so important because there are moments in life when you're on the bleeding edge and you have an epiphany and an insight that works for you that others can't see and you're going to have to go it alone. And when you, when you look for validation, the magnitude of the opportunity has an inverse relationship with the validation and evidence you're going to find, right? This was a hack. I mean, this got me to college two years earlier. And of course, there's no validation for it or else the system would fall apart. Yeah. So anyway, rolled in college, did seven years of college at night, taking care of my mother. A lot of great things started happening because I started two years earlier. Got a job as a cub reporter on a weekly newspaper called the Queen's Tribune. Won a bunch of investigative rewards but when I was like 19. Really? Yep. What were your favorite kind of stories to write? Muckraking. What in the fuck is muckraking? Muckraking is like... <laughs> <laughs> Michael, no. He might, actually. I'm looking it up right he now. He whips some shit. He'll hit me with some like vernacular from his generation. I'm like, wow. I'm going to write that down and look it up later and just pretend like I know what you're talking about. Did you find it? Yeah. The action of searching out and publicizing scandalous information about famous people in an underhanded way is what it Is says. this early paparazzi? I mean, it, it, that, that's too much credit. You know, like, so you were the early in. version of TMZ. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> like, if we want to give me that. However, though. Muckrake. Yes. Yeah, God, so, I need to figure out a way to use that often. So, so, I, <laughs> so I, I created a column. It was called the Trib Action Desk. And the people, the, the goal was people would send me little coupons with their problems, literally to the newspaper. And you can imagine a senior saying, hello, young man. You know, my tree needs trimming. However, in this pile of uh, nuisance complaints would always be another. It. That was an investigative article, <laughs> and I would blow that shit up like in a huge way. I did a big article on the cover of the paper, asbestos on the menu. You know, I was pretty good with headlines, by the way. Yeah, Con Edison caught with its plants down. Oh, I like it. It was a utility, Excellent obviously. Play. Thank you. So, did all these articles, and a lot of them got noticed. And uh, Carl Bernstein actually ended up taking a uh, position in the newspaper and nominated a series of them for a Pulitzer Prize. Now, you and I could nominate each other for a Pulitzer Prize, so the story's not as interesting. But um, my career started taking off, all because I had started. I had started two years earlier. That yeah. compound. We always talk about compounding in the context of money with like Warren Buffett, but compounding, I, I learned, applies as equally to professional success, if not more so than even than even money. So seven years of college at night. Yeah, muck raking during the day. See, I found a way to do it, Michael. You did. We can, yeah. There'll be many times for you to return to this. <laughs> We're about to get into Giuliani. We can sort of, you know, we, yeah, can, weave it, we can weave it in. So, but uh, but anyway, I get a job working for. Uh, I was profiled in an article in the in the Daily News in New York. Uh, of the headline it was uh, Matt Higgins, a real action hero. And it was me sitting on top of an algae destroyer on a lake. You know, very parochial concerns. Uh, but I got a job in the mayor's office, and my job was to disseminate the newspaper clippings. I would cut them out of a newspaper at, you know, six in the morning, mm -hmm. put them on an eight by 11, and I would distribute them. That was my job. To his staff? To his uh, press staff. Okay. But uh, secretly, off to the side, because I was a good writer, I started ghostwriting things for him and in all sorts of different ways. And also realized that in life, if you wait your turn, it's never going to happen. And yeah. I started agitating for, I wanted to be a deputy press secretary. And they're like, you're 12 years old. I was like, but uh, I seem competent enough to write all these materials. Maybe it's my time. And I didn't get the job. Again, I'm, a, I'm trying to bridge the gap from 375 or five bucks an hour to 100 grand so I can, so I can be free. Um, and I quit the mayor's office. And uh, I go get a job. Uh, working at a dead end life insurance company, it's just you know nine to five, uh, and going to law school at night, and they called me back four months later and they gave me the job. So like that's my progression. I'm I'm, I'm doing what I can. I'm applying pressure, trying mm -hmm. to get what I want. Working day and night, coming home to my mother who is wasting away slowly, and just trying to you know outrun whatever we're dealing with. And then I ran that a couple of times. Became deputy press secretary. Wanted to be press secretary. Mm, not your turn. Okay, I'm out. Quit. Not going to bring you back again. This is it. And then I got brought back. What is the actual role of the press secretary? I mean, I can't speak to what it is anymore because the whole world is upside down. But but back then it was you know run point, run defense. I guess to say you know disseminate information. But I mean, my optic on it, I think most people are what they see at like the White House press, yeah. press conferences and. I, I think I, I can only handle short snippets because both the questions and the right. answers are utterly fucking ridiculous. But I just – I'm left with almost every time wondering whether or not either side of that even believes what it is that they're asking or what's coming out of their mouth. 
Yeah, I, I look back then. The job wasn't to be at the podium the way that we think of press secretary, like White it's House most job. Yeah, it's yeah. not. It's actually not the case. It's it's managing an infrastructure of press people at all these different agencies. Right? How many? I don't know how many agencies. Forty. I don't know. Police, fire, all these different agencies. And I think it's uh, I think it's like trying to get to a draw. <laughs> where you have these two opposing voices, forces and you're just trying to put out enough information that mm. you know paints a different picture and trying to neutralize. That's how I always saw the job, as neutralizing opposing forces so that some version of the truth can manifest. Um, but I don't know. It was not an easy job, that's for sure. Yeah. Uh, how was Giuliani to work for? He's probably exactly what you would perceive. Very tough. A great administrator. Seems like he's gone a touch insane in his later years. I mean, uh, you know, I, I, I choose to remember the version 1.0. <laughs> totally fair. I don't understand this release. Yep. <laughs> you know, totally like, fair. I don't yep. get it. Um, but the version I worked for was a tough administrator. Every day, the morning meeting started at like, you know, 730. Mm -hmm. Every agency, go around the table, ran the city efficiently. It was a one-hour meeting. I mean, it, like, that. that's what I came up with. And, and because of my job, I was with him a lot. And I was with him during every crisis. So I learned a lot of what I know about crisis management management, you know, obvious to you, but through being with him at a plane crash, you know, at a at a shooting. I mean, I, I just was with him constantly during yeah. those formative years while taking care of my my, uh, my mother. But um, did you tell anybody about the burden of what was going on with your mother or were you kind of very quietly handling that in private? I think quietly handling that. My identity started to become around um, the ability to handle extreme duress. It's a lot of weight, though. It was it was a lot of weight, and not only a lot of weight. It was um it was a dirty existence. The, like I they, remember back to the break I talked about mm -hmm. when I was young. At that moment, I chose. I said, I don't live here anymore. Like I'm not here. I will I will be here, but I'm not of here. And so as a result, it was just like decline. And at the same time, she was um, less and less capable of moving, yeah. and needed more intervention, more help, more care. I would have to give her baths, help her, like all sorts of things you just don't want to do. And then well, feeling very guilty. And again, you already said it. I view that I view those things through the lens of being a parent to my children now. I don't ever want them to have to deal with those things. Right. Probably so, like my number one if I had to list all of my motivating things, it would be not not to be a burden in general, but to never burden my kids. Like that's that. what I'm saying. So even if so say you were a burden to your kids, somewhere in your kids it might be like primordial, they would be aware that that's unnatural. I don't know where it comes from. I guess we're hardwired to be kind of selfish in those formative years as much as you want to like smack them. But like if you were acting that way, you your kids would know. And I think a lot of kids who are put who are become caregivers too early fight with the tension of wanting to do the right thing and their approval now becomes about taking on the role and you start developing self-esteem from the role while knowing inside that it's not natural. Like you have a, a yearning and uh but everything was going to be okay. I finally had figured I find I had all the pieces together, right? I'm living this secret life, not amplifying it. She is, wa you know, wasting away on oxygen, and they call me back this time as press secretary to the mayor of New York, and I'm 26 and I'm in law school, and I'm like, how am I gonna do that job? Right. Yeah, now that's a lot, right? So I'm at Fordham Law at night. I'm on law review. I'm taking care of her. I'm not happy. I'm pretty depressed, you know, hiding that too. Um, you should have dealt with that in all your free time. Well, right, exactly. I tried. I, well, I was doing knitting. <laughs> I was doing knitting. Yeah. And For then about being the four yeah, seconds yeah, you had yeah, off and per day. And then doing then and then being depressed, <laughs> trying to compartmentalize both. So so I get the I get the call back to be a press secretary. Now, this is the last year of the administration. At the end, everyone wants you to out. You know, it was, felt like I could coast. And I get the call. And uh, and the job was paying a hundred and five thousand dollars a year. So it was a it was a pretty good Kager, yeah. You know, uh, so from a short period of time, and then the morning, um, the night before, again, like and then it starts hitting you. It's like well, I do not sleep. Like this is so dysfunctional. I have to, I, I feel bad for her. I don't know what to do with it. I'm trying to hear through that towel wrapped around my head, and 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 I'm like, and I got to go to work as the press secretary of the mayor of New York. I get up in the morning, and she she asked me, don't go to work today. She, she, she's like, I don't feel good. I was like, you never feel good. And we have no money and I got to go. And she just says to me, um, I ran out the uh, door and she calls me back. I'm like, what? She's like, can you give me some applesauce? And I was like, well, you know, okay, why? She goes, I'm, I'm going to be good from now on. I'm going to lose weight. I really want to, I want to take a plane. This is a lot the, so anyway, I go to work, you know, come back up the steps of city hall, you know, cop, Maddie boy, you know, you're back. And like, this is amazing. And then I, and she calls me at, um, I get the, uh, Angel in the office, uh, says, Matt, your, your mom's on the phone. I'm like, oh, fuck, I just got, it's like day one. 
And she's like, I called an ambulance. I said, Oh, that's good. I was actually relieved. And she goes, Yeah, they're 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 going to take me uh, take me in. And I said, Where are you, where are you taking her? They tell me the hospital. And then um, I actually was like, Maybe finally somebody will intervene. Mm-hmm. Like, why is it all on me? And then um, I take my time to go to meet her. And uh, and then by the time I got there, they said, I'm sorry, she had just died. So I was like, I just came, you know, with like here, I, and I was, I don't talk about this in a book. The editors are like, it's supposed to be a business book. I was like, that all blends, but I'll talk about it here. I started screaming. It was years and years of years of frustration. I just started yelling, why didn't anybody help? Like, why didn't anybody care? It was like, it just all came gushing out of me. But, you know, I talk about this publicly too because there is no guaranteed happy ending. It turns out my instincts were correct. I needed to take matters in my own hands. I just was a little bit late, right? Yeah. And now the mayor, who, say what you will about version 2.0 of Giuliani, let's make it a little light for a second, <laughs> um, he uh, he asked, is there anything I could do? And uh, they actually helped me bring her casket through the college, because that was the one place she ever felt like she had dignity. So I, I took my mother's uh, casket through through the college, and then the all of City Hall um, emptied out for this funeral. And so my mother, who would always be sitting alone in the apartment, my older brother comes there, he's like, Matthew! Was mom a maid woman? Like, who the fuck are these people? <laughs> like, it was, it was pretty incredible. But um, yeah, so that's rough. I mean, I, I try to keep that pain a little bit raw because I think within that story comes from a lot of my empathy, and I don't want to calcify or cauterize rather that wound. So it's a, it still remains a little bit of an open wound. Did you feel a sense of relief when she passed at all? I did. I didn't know what to do. I felt such failure, like all this effort to try to get somewhere. And then, and then I woke up like, what do I do with this? I can make choices now. And now I'm in this, you know, sad little empty apartment and I didn't know what to do. So this is crazy, but we had a little dog and this was the most miserable rotten animal. Um, who was its name? <laughs> Phoebe Caulfield from Catcher in the Rye. Yeah. It was a juxtaposition. Well, it was that way you didn't see her coming when she would attack you. But she, Phoebe became a metaphor. This is a little crazy. Understand trauma, right? Phoebe became a metaphor for my mother. She never wanted us to get rid of her because she felt like it was just her and Phoebe. Everybody was trying to discard the two of them, right? So I had to keep Phoebe. But then when she died, now I'm working at City Hall. Our apartment is miles away. There's no reason to be there. But I have this dog. And I'm like, I I can't get rid of Phoebe. So I would work, you know, day and night, drive home to see Phoebe. Now, Phoebe was totally codependent, you know, on my mother. She just had nobody. So I would take off my shirt put it under the door and then dry, dry, jump out the window to go back to work. So Phoebe would think I was in the room. This is completely crazy. And then, yeah, I'm just painting a picture. I'm, t- I'm sharing a lot of this too for anybody out there who's been through this kind of trauma or is taking care of a parent and the things that it does to you. So you might recognize some of yourself in this. But And then finally, six months later, I found a farm in Vermont and I paid them for seven years to take care of Phoebe and I would have them send me proof of life photos of the talk like with the newspaper to be like because well, they were charging me like 200 bucks a month I'm like it's Phoebe yeah. you know but like I needed to not have Phoebe discarded um, and then of course 9-11 happens before we get into 9-11 okay. I was just trying to definitely change the topic why do you think it was that day that she said <sighs> I'm going to change, that I want applesauce. What do you think it was about that day? I think, I love that you're asking that question because I think about that a lot. Um, uh, One, I think we always have hope, that there's still hope. It's not too late, is it? But something has to generally trigger that. Yeah, I think think she knew she was dying that day and I didn't. Looking back, her face had become more purple. Mm -hmm. But, you know, she was sick for years, so there was no reason to necessarily think. Also, I had no choice. We were literally broke. And so it's like, I have no money to even pay a caregiver to, to, to take, to bathe you. So it's like, I have to go. And that's the, always the worst. My whole, uh, form of years were the guilt, endless guilt. It's like, well, what the, like, I gotta go. But I think she knew that that it was coming. And, and it reminds me of, you know, when you're at a bar and you plead with your maker, like one more shot, mm-hmm. I think it was her pleading like one more, one more. And, uh, and I can control this. Maybe I could do something about it. God, the end is so weird, and death, and how people deal with it. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think I, I know you and I have known each other for about an hour. How's it going? 
well so far. <laughs> Buck raking. What are your thoughts? <laughs> <laughs> I just don't, maybe we should. I just want to. I want to get off on the right foot with open communication. And uh, no, I, I don't <laughs> think a lot of people would be willing to talk about this stuff. Uh, you know, I think she maybe called the ambulance because she didn't want to burden you any further. Well, so I could have called actually, you first. I didn't tell you this part. So before I went went to now, remember these trips always. We never had done an ambulance before, so this was an escalation. But these trips always were. No one. What are you going to do? Somebody's four hundred pounds. Mm -hmm. Knees are not working. You know, she has pulmonary thrombosis. You know, like legs are cracking. But there's like nothing to do, especially when you're poor, right? Everyone's just kind of pushing you through. So I went to the apartment to see to bring her some things because I felt like she might actually be in for a bit, and mm -hmm. I wanted to get her stuff. And the door to the apartment was open, and there was an ambulance in front of the house, and the ambulance doors were open too. And I was like, "This is different." And mm -hmm. so when I went in, um, uh, and then I left, I realized where was the dog? Where was the dog? And then it went on when I was at the hospital and she had just died. I when I was going up the ramp, I saw an ambulance, and I thought she was sitting in the back of the ambulance. No, I was. I I skipped this part of the story. I said. My mother came, but I know she just left. I, I saw the ambulance go, and that's when they told me. I was like, "What?" And a voice in my head said, "She wants you to thank the. Uh, she wants you to thank the paramedics." And uh, I found the paramedics. I was like, "I don't know where this is coming from, but she wanted she wanted me to thank you." And they're both like, "Oh, you know, we pleaded with her to go, but she was embarrassed because she she couldn't bathe." And I was like, "So that's always stuck with me. Like when you're poor and you're dysfunctional, how hygiene feeds into it, and how how sad." Anyway, later on, I tried to figure out why didn't the dog run out? Where was the dog? Before she died, she called the neighbor and said, can you put the dog in the, in the room? I'm going to call an ambulance. So I was like, I do think there's something to be said for organizing life a bit. And that dog, yeah. Phoebe needed to make it to the end, uh, you know, was my, was my big takeaway. But I don't, I don't know if she called it because to take it away from me or because she knew. Like, this, this is it. Could be both. Could be both. Yeah. Let's go to a lighter topic. Let's talk about 9-11. Are there any lighter topics? <laughs> <laughs> I, was like, well, I didn't come here for light topics, okay? So just to light it up, let's talk about terrorist your, attack. I watched your podcast last week about divorce. I came oh, here for that man. stuff. Yeah, oh. no, I want, this is the episode I came for. No more typing nonsense. God damn. <laughs> All right, so shortly after 9-11. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, 9-11. Yep. What Where were you on that about? day? 9-11 uh, was on the day of the primary. And like I said, everybody was done with uh, Giuliani, couldn't wait to get him out. And he was voting that day, I believe. And so my I was my job was to meet him at his polling place, do the obligatory, you know, I, yep. vo I voted thing. Um, and that's when I was driving from Queens through the, that everything lit up like a Christmas tree on the highway. And uh, that's when it all started. So where I was that morning was pivoting from instead of meeting him, meeting him on the corner of church and park. And we were going to do a press conference outside the building. Post attack. Yeah. Between the uh, not, attack was 848, I believe. And then between that and the time that they ultimately collapsed. So I was standing out on the, on the street uh, with two colleagues setting up um, a po podium. I'm not super familiar with the geography. How okay. far is that from with the actual building? Two blocks, maybe. Oh, fuck. Yeah, so you yeah. could, they, you're talking, you could probably hear. Well, I could, and you don't know what that is. Well, yeah. one, one, I had been through tons of crisis, so you're, de one, desensitized. Two, it's fog of war. You think it's a Cessna. That's a different type of crisis. I yep. thought it was a Cessna until I saw the second one. I'm like, this is probably not what but we you know, but, but even then, like, because remember, this is uh, so high up from the ground. You don't have perspective. It looked like an apple core to some extent. Right, hmm. so you see the darkness, but you don't you still didn't process it. So I was setting up a press conference with a couple of my colleagues, and the streets are emptied out, you know, and all you see are columns of firefighters going down, and we're like, this is our normal mo is to get as close to the to the crisis to demonstrate, you know, the proximity, proximity, yeah. and that you're in control. But we we're like, this this isn't this doesn't make any sense. And so couldn't get in touch with the mayor because none of the communications worked. I tried my phone. I tried the payphone across the street. So then we said, Let, let's hustle back to City Hall and try to find where, wherever they are. Didn't know where, where he was. <laughs> and as I was approaching the gates, crazy story, um, I hear this massive explosion. But the I don't know what it is. And the view is blocked by Broadway. You can't see anything. Mm -hmm. And you see this uh, white, uh, what we thought was sarin gas or something, um, rolling down Broadway with crazy velocity and everyone screaming pressing up a gates to, against the gates of City Hall. 
And How far is City Hall from the Twin Towers? Or where you know, Twin like like were? five blocks. Okay, <laughs> very so close. Still very very, very compressed. Area. Yeah, very compressed area. So okay. people are are running. Obviously, that was the first tower that was falling. And uh, remember the the the. The guard at City Hall, like, what do we do? Everyone's pressing up. It was like one of those, you know, what last I mean, last flight out of Vietnam kind of feelings. And we opened up the gates and everybody started flowing through. And I remember as the um, cloud overtook us, now we're all gagging and I'm bent over and I assume this is poisonous gas, right? So we're just like, this is it. Of course, you know, 30, 60 seconds later, you're like, it's not it. Yeah. And then, and then we resume. I know you described it as an explosion, but what did that sound like as the building started just accordion? On I itself? just just so inconceivably loud, but you don't know what a building accordion sounds like. So yeah. I thought it was a subway station being bombed. You know what I mean? Okay. Down Broadway, because you just again all the it's, you're being blocked by the Woolworth Building, so you can't quite see what just happened. And again, it's all happening so fast. <clears throat> but one of the craziest memories of my life is, you know, we leave there. I'm walking north. I went into a diner to commandeer the phone. I don't know if City Hall has been like wiped out at that point. Call the parks commissioner to say, is there a place we could use to set up a command center? This is you know grandiose, but like, okay, we have to go communicate. So, and I was making my way towards there when I found out um, where the mayor was, and we met at this firehouse. And I walk into the firehouse. First, everything has been stripped, right? There's no equipment. And there's the fire commissioner, um, Tommy Von Essen's on the floor with his heads in his hands, and he is, um, he's, you know, sobbing. Just now it's all, still remember, I still have no perspective. Like we don't, you know, it, yeah. like it's early. And then in the, uh, and in the room, I think the mayor's on the phone with the White House, with, with Vice President Cheney asking for, you know, air cover. And we all were standing in a circle, and um, the person I was with at the time said, hey, let's all send messages to uh, our loved ones to let them know we're okay. And I just handed the handed the device to somebody else and I have nobody to tell. That was like my, I was still on the, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, um, but anyway, that was the beginning all within that first you know hour. We went to a, a police academy. We set up, I did that first press conference where the mayor is asked, you know, how many casualties? And he said, it'll be more than any of us could bear. How long did it take them to actually determine the final count? I mean, probably almost like a year you know it kept changing Fuck. yeah the first thing we did after that press conference which i think was around two o'clock in the afternoon we went to saint vincent's hospital i still remember this with the mayor and it was to give a pep talk to the you know the emergency physicians and supports and there was a line of gurneys outside the hospital like waiting for the injured to show up that never People showed up that would never come that would yeah. never come we stood there for you know probably 45 minutes and just insane um did they pull a single survivor out of those they buildings? Did. I feel they like, did. But it was like yeah, less than one hand. Right? Not many, not enough for us to remember. It was, yeah, yeah there was very, very few. So yeah, I swear I remember hearing a story about like there was one small confined space that had survived. There was, exactly. There was a stairwell, yeah. right, that, that, that they survived. And, yeah, I think it was less people than you can count on one yeah. hand, though. Yeah. Fuck. But then it was, um, I mean, we can jump through it, but it was, uh, it was just like nonstop. I mean, I had a couple mandates. Back to your point, it's interesting. You said, "What does a press secretary do?" In that circumstances, that becomes a very significant job, right? I I was dealing with reporters from all over the world, and part of the mandate was to build support for the war, right, for retaliation. So, working very closely with the White House, I brought. I used to call it Liberty Tours. I brought every prime minister, every strategic person uh, through the back of. The, we set up a command center on the west side of Manhattan, out mm -hmm. of a uh, pier. And we would do the press conference with whatever the uh, head of state was, then bring them through the back on, on by water around Battery Park into and walk into the zone. So I took – That might leave a impression. Yeah, that was definitely <laughs> – that was definitely uh, – uh, so I brought, um, I brought Putin – to the site he signed and we had a, a wall put up with um russian putin russian putin back you could then. have solved the fucking ukrainian problem I, I, right I, then I, honestly i tried i tried to the back of the head i said i said sir they won't they won't join nato don't worry about it so <laughs> so, he, <laughs> so, he, so i brought him the, there was a wall 91 countries he signed i think he wrote like we're gonna get these bastards you know so every every head of state did but anyway my job was bring everybody through with the mayor doing these press conferences and then organize the commemorations because man, we're all grieving. So the one week commemoration, the one month yeah. commemoration. And then I remember I was at the site. Remember, I'm still in law school, right? And I'm like, fuck that. I'm, I mean, mom dead. Now I got to I was like, it's over. And then the dean called me when I was at the site one day. He said, I know what you're dealing with, um, but you should try to finish. And if you can pass, don't worry about um, whether you make it to class. And I was like, 
all right, I think I could do that. So I managed to juggle both those things at the same time. Did you want to practice law or did you just want to have a law degree? I wanted to, one, I needed to clean up the background. I didn't want to go on podcasts for the rest of my life and be like, yeah, you're just making excuses. <laughs> you got a GD and you went to college. Like I really was, one, I felt a little bit, um, not robbed, wrong word. I didn't feel entitled to anything, but I never feel like I got my shot to, to show that I could compete. So law school was the best I could do. Fordham yeah. Law at Night was the best I could go to. Fordham Law Law Review was the best I could perform. But then as time went by and my salary increased, it started to make less and less sense. And so... I actually got a job at a uh, big, big law firm, and uh, I was supposed to start that summer. But meanwhile, I was helping run the rebuilding of the World Trade Center site, making good money, but also one of the biggest jobs in the world at the time. And uh, I remember talking to the partner, saying, "So let me. So when I outcompete my colleagues, how long will it take for me to be a partner?" And then it's like, well, it's about 11 years, but if you do really well, it'll be like eight. I'm like eight years with a highlighter in a basement. I was like, no thanks. And then I just Kept surviving in a meat grinder, right? For waiting for somebody to anoint me a partner, and then I, um, and then I never even took the bar exam. That was it. I was like, burn the boats. But after nine eleven, this you know, we after the administration ended, I, I, um, I didn't want to leave. I felt like uh, first I felt well suited for this work. To mm -hmm. be perfectly, I'm sure you felt that in your line of work. Yeah, I felt well suited. If, you know, there's one of the only things I think I've ever been good at. Right. And I felt like the consolation prize of trauma is that I'm pretty capable of handling a crisis. And so I um, moved. I moved to the site. I got an apartment overlooking it. Really? Mm -hmm. You mean the current yeah. memorial? Yeah. Yeah. I, I, right on Chamber Street in the water. So okay. two blocks away. Wow. And I would sit on the top of the roof and I would write looking down on the on the mayhem. And then I got an office adjacent to the site on Broadway. And then we created a family room on the 24th floor, the Lower Manhattan Development Corps. And we started building this agency. And I became um, chief operating officer, transitioned out of press, and helped oversee the development of the site plan. Again, manage conflict. One yeah. side, like Giuliani says, it should just be a park and we should never rebuild. And another side wants to rebuild them exactly as they were. So it was managing all that, all that tension. I would have probably submitted a design idea in the middle like a 600 foot just middle finger statue i don't want to like hurt your artistic ambitions but i don't think you would have won i think it's great i, I mean, mean i know that finalist though right you, you might be Final a little myopic like judging from your jingoistic <laughs> background but we could have gone with like an interesting <laughs> texture or color scheme i feel like i would have hit the semifinals on the design. I'll give you that. <laughs> I, <mean, laughs> I would have finished third out of the two. Yeah. So Mike does 110. You could have been to the semi. We all have things we can't prove. <laughs> yeah. Like, uh, That's one of the heaviest sites that I've ever been to. Every time I pass through New York, we go there. And I was there in uh, January. We did this jumping tour all around the world. And one of the last, God, we did some Fox News stuff. And then we like finished the day. We went to the reflection pools and then into the 9-11 memorial and we all came out of there like fuck i need a drink yeah it's a heavy heavy place i'm very i'm very proud of it because there was no winning at the time oh, right sure. so if you had tried to win you would have lost anyway so it's one of those things where you had to um, reconcile yourself to being misunderstood which i found very peaceful like and i one of the most important chapters of my life because you just you can't pander really and it is a degree of just trying to again neutralize the forces so that you could do something great and the jury we put together was amazing we had Maya Lin on the jury the Vietnam Memorial creator mm -hmm. Vartan Gregorian historian we had only one family member which was criticized at the time she was amazing she was, her name was Paula Grant Barry and was able to step outside of her role just as a family member and create something that lasts we went I went around the country to Oklahoma to different all the different memorial sites Shanksville soon after the, I went to the Pentagon soon mm -hmm. after the crash and what you realize looking at these memorials that those that are very literal that are only meant to represent the immediate dead they lose their resonance after one generation and then then they, they just collect weeds right and you wanted to create something that people could understand forever even if they weren't born that was the mandate so when you go to the Vietnam Memorial you understand the gash you know you understand the enormity yeah. of it right so but then people were so like you they're like we just want a male figure I was gonna say <laughs> like, what were some of the 
really good crazy ideas that got floated across your desk. Oh god, it was it was <laughs> it was like a lot of like Now you've it got was a lot of like, interested, sir. Right, right. It was a lot of like <laughs> I think it was 2800, you know, floating votives that would be lit every day at the same time. It was like it was all very literal. Jeez. It was very literal manifest manifestations. Here's what people know. this is what I found fascinating about. It. It's a 16 acre site, right? But four and a half acres where the where the where the um, towers were were reserved for the memorial itself. Mm-hmm. And so if you use the word memorial, you think, well, this is the thing I'm judging. And then for those like you who wanted a middle finger, you see two uh, receding pools called reflecting absence. It's interesting. Mm-hmm. You said reflect. It's called reflecting absence, right? One acre wide, right? Now, if you were looking for redemption or retribution, you'd be looking, where's our fucking towers? Like, wh- where's our symbol against Al Qaeda, right? But when you zoom out to 16 acres, we built the Freedom Tower. Yeah, which is amazing. Do you know is- anybody there? Where? In general? At the Freedom Tower. Yeah, generally. I mean... Uh, I would like to wingsuit base jump off the top in an American flag suit to commemorate doing yeah. awesome things. Hey, what's your calendar? Let's just take a look and see what day. Are you free? I am available tomorrow. Uh, okay, okay, cool. cool. <laughs> Done. No big deal. <laughs> like New York like, City is a town that doesn't fuck around with base jumping. No. They made it a felony, which changes things in your life, and people just go elsewhere. But that is the most iconic building, I think, ever. And I think sending it in just a full American flag and landing. That'd be amazing. It would be amazing. I don't think you'd get 18 miles though, right? How many miles? How far? I wouldn't do, even try to get What is the math? Miles? How do I figure out how far oh, you can no. go? I'd your... be lucky to clear the first little uh, ledge. So that would be my immediate goal. <laughs> I'm not really worried about the distance. <laughs> Good. I'm just, you got math, because neither of us know math. And At I thought, all. is there a calculation where there's like no. a hypotenuse? Cap- camera one, camera two, camera one, <laughs> yeah, camera two. Yeah. is how you kind of roll with base jumping. <laughs> Well, we'll try to put you in touch with something. That's what I'm talking about. Yeah. All right. so, but it all reads as one. Now when you look at it, when you went there, right, it's pretty amazing. I it mean, is amazing. Like and the could... Freedom Tower is spectacular. It is. It is. Question, because I'm under the impression that the the pools, that is the exact footprint of the buildings that existed it envel- before. It envelops, so okay. it's not perfectly. But I mean, but pretty but damn pretty close. Pretty damn close. Yeah. I mean, the, the, they were one acre, one acre, uh, right? For, uh, the, there's some mechanical and whatnot, yeah. but it's pretty damn close. Okay. So my job was to navigate... The architects, you know, the people who dreamed of a living city where every road would go perfectly through it. Like, th- and then, and then, of course, there are those who lost loved ones who mm. wanted principally to be about remembrance. And so, I mean, I, I'm very, very proud of that. I mean, it was a two year period to go from attack to a site plan rolled out. That is basically what you see today. Whereas if you look at other places, they get mired in conflict. And the challenge was you don't you don't memorialize so soon after the incident because you don't have perspective. Everything's raw, right? And so the, to be doing this under duress because we had to rebuild the city, so there was an you know exigency to the to doing the memorial that made it that much more you know complicated. But you can imagine me now. I'm going from personal trauma to just yeah. like global trauma for you know, sure for two and a half years straight. How long did the site actually smoke for? Almost a year. It was burning couple thousand degrees for I mean I f- I'm going to I'm going to get this wrong but I'm going to say probably remove the last um body in like May I think of 2002 I could be completely wrong but it was a very long time yeah. I remember my office was overlooking so they would sound the alarm every time and um yeah but God one damn. thing I want to tell an um, interesting story um it's about Bush and this is, speaks to crisis communications too. I don't know if you remember, but he was being cr- heavily criticized in the immediate aftermath. Right? Yeah, and it's it, correct me if I'm wrong. It's based on somebody walking up to him and, and whispering to him when he was at the school, and they didn't. People were judging his right reaction. Right, it was like a degree flat footed because they whisper in his ear, and then he doesn't stop. He has a look of horror, obviously, but he still continues. You can tell instantly that something yeah. is on his mind. Yeah, and then, so then there's that. Then there's the plane circles planet Earth for a very long time, right? Yeah. So there's a you know, and there's a picture of him looking down from the plane. So unfairly, probably, and and a degree of somebody they're not advising perfectly about symbolism when you're at war. Pearl Harbor just happened, right? Yeah. However, fast forward, it was my job to work with. Um, the Secret Service and the Vice President's office to plan his trip. A couple of days later, which was a remarkable series of events, we've been up all night. And I don't know if you remember this, but it's interesting how one image and one one thing can change the trajectory of perception. But he was walking the site, um, and there was a firefighter standing on a pile, and President Bush climbs up the pile yep. and stands, puts his arm around a guy and is using a bullhorn, and I'm standing with a bunch of construction workers, right? It looks like it's enormous, but actually it's in a tiny little contained area. And one of the guys goes, Mr. President, I can't hear you. And he replies, well, I can hear you. And soon the people who did this will hear us too. 
And that was, you know, I remember it well. Do you know what I remember the most about that, though? Go back and look at a picture of that. That poor bastard firefighter, he had the megaphone in his ear. That guy probably submitted a disability claim later for deafness. So here I am being vu- here I am being it's vulnerable so- with you, and it's sharing like a thing from the Smithsonian. And all you fucking care about is tinnitus and a guy. The instant I saw that happening, you could see the firefighter. He's just like, Mr. I'm like, dude, move the megaphone over a little bit. You're blowing the fucker's eardrum out. I'm glad that's your takeaway. But I mean, I don't know why things stick with me or other people. No, that's fair. Yeah. No, that's fair. And that's fair. But what a moment, right? Whole thing changes from that second forward. You know, and he was I got to spend a lot of time with President Bush throughout my career. I always found him to be remor had an extraordinary memory and um and a big heart, say what you will, about wars we shouldn't have gone into and whatnot. But when I saw him with the family members that day, eyes all moist, very, very sensitive. I've had some incredible little Forrest Gump moments with him yeah. throughout my career, but you know, that that was one of them. And then I spent the day with him with family members. He is my number one bucket list podcast guest because that moment shifted the trajectory of so many people's lives and I was there for the initial invasion of Iraq in March in 03 and I was in Afghanistan in 2002 late 2002 and then bouncing back and forth and I just I would love to talk with somebody about everything involved in that the the flow of information what was what was he basing decisions off? Because it's so easy to look 20 years in the rearview right. mirror. But what were his thoughts? What were his reservations? What was he thinking about? When you commit a nation to war as the president, how much time did you think about the cost and the flag draped cab, uh, coffins that you know are eventually going to come back? It's just the ability to sit. Because for me, my experience with the war was walking around in those two countries. His experience with the war was committing our nation to war. I mean, obviously, it takes more steps than that. Um, but we were exact polar opposites of the spectrum. And I, fuck, I think we could talk for like 10 hours. So why don't we set an intention? Well, give us a time frame. How long do we have to pull this off? Michael, would, are you available Thursday? Yeah. Yeah, let's do it. <laughs> I was going to ask for 18 months, but hey, cool. I will. I don't care how long it would take. I will go anywhere and take any amount of time that he has because I don't know how much time he spent talking with somebody who – I was in my early 20s. I remember I turned on – I was living on the West Coast. I turned on TV. In my mind, I feel like it was a few seconds before the second plane went in, but I think it was a couple minutes because I remember the news, like, literally a news anchor, like, how the fuck do you fly a Cessna into the World Trade Center? Did you not see that in the windshield? And then it's like, and then everybody shifted. My first thought was, well, I should probably get in and go to work because Bush probably has my phone number and I'm sure he's dialing it right now (laughs) because it's go time. Fucking years later, I finally deployed overseas, but it... It shifted my life from a conceptual world of training for war to a practical world of actually going and doing those things and trying to actually get the revenge and retribution. And the information that would make its way to me, fuck, I'm just fascinated by the information that would make its way to him. Because we lived as far apart as humanly possible, metaphorically and physically. I think it would be fascinating. I haven't heard him do much of like he went and started painting, right? I mean, that was the uh, maybe he doesn't want to. Yeah, you know, who knows about his? I mean, because I view my own decisions and judgments twenty years ago through a very different lens now. Well, I'm, remember pre-Trump, the the practice was that you recede from the limelight. And you don't complicate things by having dual presidents, right? So, yeah. So maybe he's just observing that. I don't care. I like my conversation that I would want to have from him would specifically be about committing a nation to war and what. What were people telling him? What was he thinking about? Like if he was sitting and laying in his bed at night, staring at the ceiling because he couldn't sleep, what was it that actually kept him up? Like what was the thought process involved? Because I know it kept me awake, and I was on the absolute front leading edge of the scalpel that he sent across the globe. I had a um – I had an amazing interaction not that long ago with a gentleman whose job it was to carry the uh, the suitcase. The football? Right? Football. Oh, sorry, suitcase. <laughs> it's the football. I think it is a suitcase. Well, I was going to say, but, yeah. you know, come on. Like, uh, I wonder why they call it a football anyway. Where does that metaphor come from? I don't from? know, but I look like I don't know what I'm talking about if I call it a suitcase. Well, you can't throw it. It's yeah, handcuffed, no, that's my fair. understanding. Right. Well, the, well, well the, <laughs> and he said that part of his job was to brief him on, on casualties overnight. And that the president, like, how did we do last night? You know, like, yeah. and really... That was the guy I remember, which is interesting that history will remember him as somebody who took failed intelligence and committed us to a war, which is true. He's also – Saddam Hussein was also evil. Yeah. So that's true. You know, I mean there's a lot of truce happening at the same time. Um, but I would love to know too what, like, what was I mean, going on behind the scenes. I remember arguing with my dad who was a Vietnam veteran and he was very against 
the way that we were going about uh, positioning and talking about the Iraq war. And I remember arguing with him about it. Like, you don't know what you're talking about. Because I was a young man who was getting exposed to war for the first time, and it's all I'd ever wanted to do. Not necessarily war, but practically execute the job that I had. And it, yeah, looking in the rearview mirror, I think the history books are going to judge us pretty poorly on Iraq the farther we get away from it. But I've also arrived at a place where I don't regret the time that I spent there. That's the country that I actually got shot in. I got shot in the hip in 2005 in Iraq on the border between Baghdad and Fallujah going after some fucking no-name kidnapping cell. But do you think history will judge it because it was um, an unwarranted war or because of the consequences of how we destabilized the region because of the war? Like, I think C, all of the above. Yeah. And, and I think a really good argument could be made for the military-industrial complex and their desire to be involved from a monetary perspective in engaging in war. I mean... That is a fact. The chow halls in Afghanistan were staffed by people from, like, Nigeria... And, you know, it's like you look at all of these things that have to happen. There's like military soldiers and then the whole caboodle that has to go to support them actually going overseas. The gas, the ammo, the planes, the security. How are we going to feed these people? Are we going to bathe these people? Where are they going to go to the bathroom? Like, the amount of money that was made. I, I, think, I forget what it was, but I think, Michael, if you could look this up. Mm -hmm. at the peak, At the peak of both Afghanistan and Iraq, I think it was a billion dollars a day is what it cost the U.S. taxpayer. A lot of that shit was going to private hands. Mm, it's true. And it's like, I don't know why people avoid that. I actually think if we were to throw that under the spotlight and force people to take uh, accountability of that, and, and like this is actually what happened, and this is what will continue to happen unless we change course when it comes to these decisions, maybe we'll be a little bit more hesitant. Well, I was going to say, I'll, I'll at least be aware that there's a gravitational pull of a yeah. very strong lobbying force that has an interest in resupplying the weapons yeah. and spending them. And th there was never be a world where the politicians that were in power during that time would go be like chairmen of the board at any of these organizations. That would never happen because there's no financial benefit to them. Oh, wait. <laughs> right, right, right. <laughs> wait a second. But let's look at that. Let's make sure that shit can't happen. Yeah. But, it, I mean, I just... I think that conversation would be fascinating. I don't know if he'd be willing to have it. Maybe he doesn't want to, and I don't know. You know, I don't know if I would blame him if he didn't want to. Yeah, I haven't heard it. I had an, so I had an amazing moment. Fast forward, so I, I was with him a few times during that nine eleven period, and then um, ten years later, I was uh, overseeing the New York Jets football team, right, the business of the team, and it was my job to. We had the game on the tenth anniversary in New York, and I put together a commemoration where we, you know, recreated the uh, Twin Towers on the field with light, with uh, with family members. It was incredible. Um, yeah. John Mayer played More Than a Bird, yep. which is extraordinary. First time he had played it since 9-11. And I had a surprise for everyone. I had President Bush. And we were together in the... Uh, in the locker room. Now, it's incredible. Play hide the president. It's not easy, right? Yeah, good luck with that yeah, one. Yeah, right. So nobody it's not like an individual you can just put a sack over there or like a yeah. mascot hat on it. So nobody in the stadium, <laughs> nobody in the stadium knew. And I'm in the I'm in the locker room with Mike Tanema. I was the GM, the GM of the Jets. And uh, Bush is just like a guy too, right? So he's eating a sandwich. He's like, Mike, what, 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 what was that with that draft? You know, like he's <laughs> giving him shit. And I had this incredible moment. And I tell him, hey, Mr. Pre crazy memory, right? I'm a, like a random nothing in the scheme of things. Like, for, I remember, yeah, we were walking with Karen, you know, right by the memorial. Like, anyway, walking out the um, uh, walking out the locker room, just the two of us and the Secret Service, whatnot. And he walks out, and as he as he walks out, they they are screaming USA, USA, and giving cheering him. And he came back, and he is crying, like, and he says. Uh, I'm just overwhelmed. It's the first time anyone's cheered, you know, and yeah. God knows when. But just like, there's another side to him. History, I think, will redeem him more and more. But it was an incre incredible, again, Forrest Gump, Gump moment to be there with him 10 years later. I'm putting all my faith in you to make this happen. I'm, I, that's why I wanted 18 months. I'll give, you eight, I'll give you fucking six years if you want, even if I'm not doing the podcast anymore. Well, I, 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 <laughs> I, need the, I need the pressure. It's the book is about it, right? Like I need the, Six yeah, months. Six. Oh, fuck. <laughs> I, need a, I, need a, I need a hook, though. Is Black Rifle Coffee? Like what, what is the- uh, He is a Texas guy. Right. They, they have corporate offices in Texas. I don't maybe, know. Maybe, maybe he would, I mean, You know what? You know, it's, maybe it's a, a fundraiser. It's a live podcast where we raise money and for uh, A live veterans. podcast, we raise money- with every donation, you can submit a question that might be asked live to the president. 
Okay. And we will randomly select those questions so it won't matter like the dollar amount. And the more that you donate, the more questions you can submit. Why do you got to complicate shit? I was just trying to get it done. I am the idea guy. You're the execution guy. Right. <laughs> I am it was all perfect. Big like... end of the colander. You are the narrow end of the filter. All right, we're taking it. We're taking it to Texas. We go live. I feel I like. like I, mean, I think maybe, we can pull it off. Okay, wait. Maybe oh, wait. there doesn't even need to wait, be a hook. He wait, might want to have a conversation wait, like that. Now I'm not even realize there is a, a precedent for this for this degree of serendipity and happenstance. I will summarize very quickly. After he gave the speech in 2006 justifying the surge, right? Mm -hmm. I thought it was so good because he was finally communicating and taking custody. I go upstairs and I bang out an email. <laughs> and I'm like, I'm going to send an email to the White House. Not going to say who I am or anything like that. And I'm going to praise him for his communication style. And I'm just going to release it into the world. 45 days later, I get a handwritten note from the president. I just wanted you to know, I read your email, you're absolutely right, the job, the job is to be educator in chief and I need to go directly to the pe people and bypass the news filter. So I'll have it framed in my desk. So that might have set the stage for this conversation, yeah. right? Like that was chapter one, and now we're gonna go ahead and get them on your podcast. You seem, would, you, seem un, you seem unmoved by my incredible story. I like it. Okay. I, I My concern is he just may not wanna talk about it anymore. I think, I, I don't know if there would have to be a hook because if he does, Want to have a conversation? Maybe that's just he wants to sit down and talk with somebody who had my experience. Maybe he's fascinated with somebody like he, with a stroke of a pen, can commit a country to war. I mean, again, I realize people it's not that easy, but he never got anywhere near the experience that I had from the the end state or end result of the decisions that those in power made. All right, we're gonna work on it. All right, I like it. Let's see. How the hell did you end up working for the Jets? I apologize for working for such a shitty football team. Too. I know. Can we take a quick? Yeah, of course. Yeah. Bathroom break. Yeah, but I don't course. want to ruin the vibe. No, we're okay. going to talk about the right. Jets when All we right. get back. All right. Cool. Jets. All right. So I found <laughs> the. You're asking about how much per day. Yeah. Right? What was it? So I'm getting a lot of different answers. This one says 300 million a day. <laughs> Those are rookie numbers. We can do way better. Yeah. Than that. You're not but, using. You're using Chat GPT 3.5, aren't you? Yeah. <laughs> oh, I could have used Chat. I'll use that real quick. But uh, six God, now trillion I'm fascinated what it would spend. total. Six trillion total. But yes, I think I heard the billion a day number. I think at the peak, like, like when me. Afghanistan yeah. and Iraq, like highest level of troops, highest level of activity at any one time. Oh fuck, Michael's straight down the Chat GPT. <laughs> yeah, in Iraq per day. So the Jets. Okay. How did you end up there? So um, I, and again, talk about this in my book, but this idea of leverageable assets, I'm pretty good at never letting anybody put me in a box, right? So mm -hmm. I didn't want to be a government worker. So zooming out, it's like, well, I'm not really a government worker. I'm somebody who knows how, how to manage a complicated land use process in the middle of the capital of the world. And the New York Jets never had their own stadium. So they needed somebody to run a stadium campaign. Where'd they play? Uh, they they played uh, they played at the Meadowlands, but they were partners with the Giants, and it was the Giants Stadium. So everything about that stadium was the Giants. Everything about that is fucked. I mean, like, <laughs> go team! We love our Jets, we but love we actually way. don't have a right. home the stadium. Stadium, <laughs> stadium is has blue and we're green, but forget about that. That's Ugh, okay. That's rough. Yeah. Right. So the so the so the Jets finally wanted to have their own home, and I was somebody who knows how to manage that kind of craziness. Yeah. So I ran the effort to build them a stadium, which ultimately succumbed to nimbyism in New York. And then we took our marbles and we uh, built a new stadium with the Giants as equal partners in, uh, and then moved the training center to New Jersey as well. So I ended up running the uh, business of the team over the course of those eight years. Is that a thing in New York? Like, do you have to declare, are you a Giants or a Jets guy? Is that like a kind of a line in the sand? Yeah. Can you be both? No. Really? No, unless There's you're, no a, room unless for you're it, huh? a pandering politician, <laughs> you know. Like, no, it would, be, it would be pretty, 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 pretty bad. You can't just say, "Hey, I'm just a fan of the sport, and mm -hmm. I don't really care." It's like, no, you're <clears throat> Jets no. or Giants. No, yeah. that would be pretty pathetic. Yeah. Okay. So. Fortunately, I grew up a Jets fan, so that was fine. Not a huge sports fan. Uh, yeah. but growing up as a kid, I was a little bit busy hawking flowers. But nonetheless, yeah, it's usually historically Jets, Mets, and Islanders go together. Okay. Kind of a, it's been somewhat of a sad lot. But when I was there, those were the golden years. I don't know how much of a football fan you are, but that was the Rex Ryan years. I am familiar with, I'll be honest with you, I pay almost no attention to professional sports. It seems to me like there's always a world championship of some kind, and I find it hilarious that sports that only occur inside of the U.S. have a world championship. <laughs> like, every quarter there's one. It's like, I can't keep track of hockey. I swear to God, they just played the Stanley Cup last yeah. week, and now it's the semifinals. Like, what the fuck is going on? Baseball, football, 
apparently we have a professional soccer league. I don't know. I'm, we I'm, do. I'm yeah. out of all of that. I, <laughs> nothing but appreciation for those who are enthusiastic about it. Never been my cup of tea. That's fair. Yeah. No judgment. Yeah. I was a little, I was busy. You know, I was doing no, other good. things. Same. Same. I ended up as an accidental sports executive. It wasn't my dream. Why did you decide to leave the Jets? <clears throat> because uh, I realized I enjoy um, the act of creation, uh, presiding over a mature brand. I can do it. I could run operations, but I'd much rather be creating. Yeah. <clears throat> and then um, I decided if I don't if I don't do this now, I'm never going to do it. It's a very heady job, obviously, sitting on the 50 yard line, beautiful office. But it was everybody's dream job of mine, and I think you have to be cognizant of that when you're making decisions based on reputation. And so, um, I went out on, on my own. I ended up um, partnering with the owner of the Dolphins who is very, very entrepreneurial, Stephen Ross, brilliant, largest developer in the United States, one of them at least. Does he still own the uh, Dolphins? <clears throat> he still owns the Dolphins, and we became partners. My Half the job was overseeing the Dolphins, mm -hmm. helping them uh, on the business front, which I did, put together a, um, a management team, became vice chair. But my passion was building this portfolio of consumer brands that I've been doing for the last decade. So version 1.0 of me was um, starting from scratch, incubating companies, uh, and then eventually acquiring companies outright. So some brands people may know listening, Magnolia Bakery, um, Banana Pudding. You're looking at me with a blank stare. Like, why are you talking about Banana Pudding on my podcast? But yeah. Well, no, I think it's awesome. <clears throat> but I guess my question is, having the desire and dream to do that, where do you actually start, though? Yeah, that's a great question. I mean, you start with somebody who believes in you and looks past the fact that you have no business doing it. I've, that's what I'm talking about. But I mean, well, let's <laughs> right. You know what I'm saying? Well, let's get into it. I have this idea of uh, leverageable assets, right? Everybody out there listening has something about them that makes them special, that can move them slightly closer to where they ultimately want to do, even if it's not the job that you want to do. My leverageable asset at the time is I know how to run a sports team, even though I didn't want to do it. And so the need that he had was, I need somebody to oversee this. So yeah. It's not going perfectly. My dream, though, was to be an entrepreneur. Like I had architected my life, the GD story, right? I've, I'd always been creating, and I and I had all these ideas in my head and people I wanted to back, and I needed a benefactor. And I just happened to get lucky. I was able to align the leverageable asset with the need with somebody who was willing to take a shot. When did you realize <clears throat> that you were onto something and that it was going to work out? My first, my first uh, batch of ideas mostly involved backing great people. Um, my partner, a guy named Jesse Darris, he was a great PR guy. I knew that he was meant to be more. We put him in business, uh, built a firm, um, recently sold it for tens of millions of dollars, put together an incredible portfolio of, of uh, direct-to-consumer companies, probably 15 unicorns in that portfolio. I'd say it was my ability to recognize greatness in others and then figure out how to unlock them. Sounds corny, but the ability to be like, I, I, have, a, I have a sense. This mm -hmm. goes back to my early days of trauma. I, the consolation prize of trauma is refined pattern recognition, right? Because you're always hyper vigilant. You're always scanning the horizon for danger. That actually is very useful in business. You could sniff out people's insecurities, vulnerabilities, the missing conversations. And so my, my, my first round of investments were backing great people a little bit earlier or, you know what I mean? Yeah. And those played out spectacularly. The first deal I ever did, actually, is to back a guy named Gary Vaynerchuk. Some people listening will know him. Gary's an internet, you know, social media wonderkind, and he's ubiquitous. But I gave him um, eight Jets tickets to become the first client of a firm that didn't exist yet <laughs> <clears throat> with, with two mandates. Make us, like, the number one team in social media undeservingly and make me the guy in sports who gets it so I can trade off your ideas and get – and get and, and, be that guy, which is what we did. And How did I, he respond to that pitch? I didn't say it exactly that. Yeah. <laughs> so it was more, I used muck, you know, different words, course, right? Yeah. A little high vocabulary, right? Yeah. But uh, long and short, created the firm, launched the firm with those uh, Jets tickets, went back when I partnered with Stephen Ross and acquired a significant minority stake in the firm and became his only partner. Fast forward, we have 2,000 employees, you know, 300 million in revenue, multiple Super Bowl commercials. So it was recognizing like, hey, this isn't that hard. You know, and that's why I love working with, with guys who are transitioning from the military because they're getting an MBA, especially the elite operators, right? They're in a program, but they're insecure because they don't know what they don't know. And a lot of what times you it's need, true story. right? You need somebody to demystify it. Like, like everybody's full of shit. Excel doesn't matter that much. That's not the important part. It's pattern recognition. So once I get a little bit of confidence, I started realizing like, this isn't that hard. And um, those sound like long-term investments though. Like that seems like there's a substantial amount of time in backing these people for it to build. Well, I'm lucky in that I'm not a fund and I'm partnered with somebody who thinks in decades. I was gonna, well, that was going to be my next question. Like what kind of timeline 
are we talking about for an ROI on that? That's that's not going to be days, weeks, months. Yeah, we we um we're a little different in that none of our deals have an exit provision or an exit horizon. They just it's build until it can't be built anymore. A lot of I think people, especially funds, like they worry so much about like structure and when when are you going to exit? When the reality is, it's the founder that will dictate that largely. When they run out of steam or they have they have a you know a different idea about their life, you'll know when it's in trouble. There'll be a catalytic event that force mm-hmm. it's a forcing function. So we um, we just work it. You know, is the investment largely made whole if they do exit or sale? Uh, ours, you mean? Yeah. I would like them to be. I yeah. mean, we've got zeros too, but it's actually worked out pretty good. I mean, fast forward, we're talking almost a billion dollars deployed. What is the biggest steaming pile of shit you accidentally have hooked your wagon to in the business world when it comes to backing somebody? And I need specific names, legal spelling. Okay, wait. <laughs> but I, I need you to be a little more precise. Like, is, what's it, is, the, is there a redemption narrative or they remained a steaming pile of shit? I mean, w- something you were like, this is going to be awesome. And a little bit into it, you're like, oh, fuck, where's the ejection button? <laughs> <laughs> well, so. I need the train wreck that's story. That's funny you said. Yeah. So <laughs> I have to polish this up. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, I, mean, no, I was joking. But no, 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 I'm, no, I'm, as broadly no, as no, I'm, no, I'm yeah. kidding. No, I'm kidding. Actually, we took on something very hard. Which was based on an epiphany. We knew, you know, since you don't know anything about sports, this is going to be a hard conversation. Maybe Michael could take the I mean, seat I for a second. I don't know anything about sports. Right. I don't really follow them. Michael, feel free to jump in if you yes, want. Yes, we'll do. Yeah. So, so he no so, shit. About She's like fourteen. <laughs> so European football, yeah. otherwise known here as soccer, soccer yeah, right. right? We knew that would be huge in the United States because there was a match held at Miami mm-hmm. that did phenomenally well on a Wednesday night. It was uh, Barcelona versus you know Chivas, and it sold out at a time when the team wasn't actually selling out. Right. So. Yeah, uh, Steven, myself, we're all like, this is, we're on to something. So we decided to create a tournament where we would bring all the major teams in the world to the United States, build a brand. And like, this is dealing with Yankees to the 10th power, like Man United, yeah. Real Madrid. Like, it's hard. They're powerhouses. They get, they get to set the terms. Yeah. So the logistics involved in creating a tournament where at any one moment you have 22 matches happening all over the country at the same time, everything that's involved with that, we, we began to build this tournament a decade ago. And then in order to hold on to the territory, right, the market, we were like, well, now we got to go to China. So now I'm operating matches in China. And then we're like, we're going to go to Singapore. And then we got a Bridget in Europe. So huge undertaking of this match. Like the kind of like risk that would make me shake like a rabbit in the middle of the night. Like, oh man. I mean, lots of money, tens yeah. of millions, and then eventually all north of 100. Like a lot to go into it. So moments of like, how am I going to find my way to a viable business? And then it's always about people. There was a person in our miss, um, name is Danny Silman. Just incredible deal maker, great operating ability. He became the CEO of this business, and we pivoted our way into a, an amazing place. And so we are now partners with UEFA, and we sell the Champions League media rights in the United States and South America. We're partners with La Liga. We sell their media rights. So we we morphed it into a media rights entity. And I like that story because there was moments where I'm like, how am I going to turn this into a viable business. No matter what we do, we can't quite make the PL work, right? Because mm-hmm. you're renting the content, basically, right? You're paying them a fee to put on these matches and then you're trying to sell it. Yeah. Um, but if you if you work hard enough and you constantly be open minded to iterating, you eventually find your way. So this business is now a great business. So, but it was a big pile of shit at one point. Or at least it would make me shake like a rabbit. When does most of my bad ideas honestly were ones where as a, like I I wanted I wanted momentum. I was anxious to get going. And I look back at my partners being actually very kind, but he would tolerate these like stupid <laughs> ideas. So I came to him like, I got this great idea. Like when you're in a stadium and you're looking down below and you see empty seats in the third quarter, like that stadium, that seat could have been resold. Why don't we create an app where somebody can go ahead and buy that seat in the middle? Of It'd the... be called Seat Sniper. Right. I can or, help you with right, this. Right. Thank you. Right. It was, so, <laughs> so by the way, you'd be very good at it. Uh, it was called Leap Seat. So I went ahead, I, recruit, I recruited a, a, a superstar, uh, her name is Andrea, to run this business. And like, I could just imagine what Steve is sitting there like, okay, Junior, this is a really think of big. Anyway, now, fairness, I, I, I killed it You know, after like six months realizing this, this, this is a feature, not a business. At Those least that's a mo- viable idea. I'd have ideas like we should make rims for vehicles out of chocolate in case you feel like you need a snack and you're stuck in traffic. Okay. Like, that's the kind of idea that I would have. And be like, well, what if you live somewhere where it's hot? I'm like, fuck, I didn't think it through. Well, that's why you 
you said you're the dreamer, right? <laughs> I, I'm, I'm the one who's got to execute yeah. these ideas. And, you know, they're, <laughs> they're, but those are most of my misses when I would mistake like a feature for a business. But mostly they were driven by like oh, at the time I was going through something on the personal front. I was just anxious for mo- momentum, right? And yeah. my, my, my prism was distorted. I just wanted to get going and do some stuff. So I don't do that anymore. I make bigger dumb mistakes, but not those. When does money become abstract? Meaning, I know so many people, and I've gotten trapped in this myself younger, like, I'll just make all decisions based off of money because I need to get to uh, two commas in my bank account or three commas. Like, at what fucking point does it become abstract? Like, you can do what you want, and you can't do any more than what you want. So, like, what becomes the point of all this? Yeah. Are we want to peg it to a number or, or a I mindset? Just, I mean, like, well, either or. I well, mean, I, I learned a few things having not come from money. Yeah. Um, and not particularly wedded to money. Uh, I like what money can enable, right? But I've never defined my stuff by like stuff. You know, I, I just don't. Not that I don't like nice things. It's just not how I'm wired. But when I did come, uh, uh, come into money, I found it, but I worked for it. But, um, I didn't realize that uh, that the only way to have money is to try to actually get more money. That might be slightly controversial, but the reality is if you want to stay wealthy, you have to try to get wealthier. Yeah. And I didn't realize that because once you have a degree of money and you've sort of reached the summit, you're like, oh, good, I can breathe. And then your relationship with money changes. You start relating to money for your capacity to lose it as opposed to what it represented. So Fuck. I, I would take these fucking swings and be like, oh, under grand, it's no big deal. I'd be like, wait, that, like they're starting to add up. And then I had a reset saying, oh, I, like, I have to continue as I was and attempt to make more. Not out of greed, as it's the only way to maintain it. You know, it's like only helicopters hover, right? Humans are either ascending or descending. And so if I don't try to make more. Now, unless you're an incredibly disciplined person. Who well, can, doesn't that put you on a racetrack that has no end? Not if you're not, not if it doesn't occupy mental space. Okay. If you do it reflexively, right? So I'm not doing it out of necessity. I'm doing it because it's a simple truism. Mm-hmm. But on the same time, uh, I also noticed as you have more, I teach at Harvard Business School, right? Like I've got all these, you know, credentials now. The credentials become their own prism that makes you more risk adverse because you have more to lose. Maybe I'll get canceled or maybe, maybe I'll, and I realized actually that's a terrible way to live. So I consciously meditate the same time as realizing I got to continue to strive for, for, for money to have it. I define what I need as narrowly as possible consciously. So even you and I talking, like I know I need my wife. She's my best friend in the world. I don't need much more in her in terms of a friend network. I need my children's respect and their peace and joy. And I need enough money so I can always say F you to anybody that I might work for. I don't need much more than that. So, and that makes me able to take risk. And I find people, as they have more things, they become more risk adverse. Stakes get higher. I also want to be able to tell people to fuck off. I think you can. Let's throw a, what number is good for that? Because that's going to be Michael and I's sole goal in life. I think you Michael and I's sole goal will be for me to have that much money. So I can tell people to fuck off. You're on your own, Michael, okay. on your execution. Right, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to frame it differently because it's a personal choice. So here's a – I actually do want a book, write a book called Fuck You Money, and it's about fuck you to the voice in your head and anybody around you. You know what I mean? Like, I like how it. Do you, I would read the write, shit right, out of that I'm gonna, I'm gonna do that book. But let's put – rather than put a number, I don't think it's a number. I think it's um, time. Money is actually the uh, – really just units of time. So I would say the fuck you number to me is a, is a, is a number that enables you to live three years on your own because you can build anything in three years. Uh, if you have skills to include rebuilding yourself, I would right. say. So yeah. I'm saying so three, most people, a lot of people have that. I mean, it's again, if you can retrench a bit, like a lot of people have three years. Fuck you, Michael. Exactly. That's what I'm saying. Right, right. <laughs> <laughs> we did it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. That's actually, that's actually, I think way more digestible for people than somebody to be like, Oh, you need to have a hundred million dollars. People are like, well, I'm out. Well, I you know? started because thinking about my cohort, right? I mean, I'm, I run this fund. I'm in New York and, and I found myself subconsciously moving the goalpost. Plus not pride is the wrong word. I don't think I feel pride per se, but feeling, um, at ease and we're talking to my wife and it's like this is such a stupid universe that's like you know uh, like minimum viable dose right like why why does one need to, idea to try to be a billionaire is a, is a ludicrous i think even the word millionaire has a cringy feeling to it to me it's just about time and optionality right and i yeah. that started making me a lot more peaceful like it's almost gross to try to aspire to a particular number it's like just how much time do i get to make my own decisions i can't even wrap my head around a billion dollars like oh yeah a thousand million like but I think once you lot. have enough money to eat out whenever you want, 
take a vacation whenever you want within reason spend a decent amount of money on that vacation and uh and 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 have some money in the bank to last a few years like everything else is mostly gratuitous i would add to that the ability to say no to things you don't yeah, want to do that's true although i find it still hard even with money yeah like i i i struggle with that the conflict of letting people down is no easier now than it was before so it wasn't about money it was about the friction of it the time and energy to disappoint Coming from the environment you did with your mom in poverty, what are your thoughts on money with your children now? Because um, their lens, as hard as you may try, will be different than your lens was. And I, I don't, I'm don't. i not going to put a value judgment on that, but I'd certainly from somebody who has lived from one extreme to the other, fuck, that's a challenge. I, I find I have this conversation with people a lot. Like my partner, David Chang, owns Momofuku. He was asking me this question like, you know, coming from where you came from and building yourself, are you like basically all the Harvard kids? Fuck you. You know what I mean? <laughs> like, 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 or, you know, like, you know, or anybody's gone to it. And I said, actually, I, I'm completely the opposite because I think it's actually peddling a lie to say that I wish I wasn't born into a normal situation. I would I would love to have been born into a yeah. two parent functional household. Number one, if I'm honest, there's a lot of damage that took a long time that showed up in lots of different ways from that dysfunctional environment. It would have been better to not have it. So to judge somebody because they didn't have it, it doesn't make any sense. It's also a lie because I would have liked to have had it. So it's like retribution for what was denied of me. It feels but would you trade it for what you have now? Probably. Really? Yeah. I mean, I, I would like to say, and the only reason I'm saying that is I'm saying I'm like, but watch me, I'm going to get it anyway. <laughs> <laughs> like, so I don't really, I don't really mean it, yeah. but I would have liked to, of course. I mean, so, but second point about the kids. So now if I judge that person with the resume and the pedigree, now I'm also judging my own children. I also reject this idea. I saw some people who have like grew up with hardship and then they've made it. They want to like prosthetically install hardship, manufacture hardship for their children. And I think that's a, that's a myth. Can't be done anyway. Also, why did I work so hard? If I'm going to like try to do that. Yeah. And then the last point for me, I think the reason for children become rotten of rich people, and I've seen a lot, you know, it's like I can trace it back to the parent. I think if your children are rotten and you have money, it's because you were rotten in some way or you made them rotten. And you probably did it by by um, making people feel bad about your wealth or your or what you got. And so I do not yeah. I don't define myself that way. I think it does, I now I define myself by the grind. So now if my children work incessantly, it's because they're like dad's out of his mind. I do, I do, not that I judge others for the grind, but the grind is what I enjoy, right? The creativity of it. Yeah. So I work seven days a week. I don't leave them, but like it's just part of my fabric of my life all the time, right? And they probably see that. How'd you end up on Shark Tank? So, um, so my kids don't care about sports at all. <laughs> <laughs> But how, how old are they, by the way? Uh, I, well, I've I've uh, I have a new set and a, the existing set. So there's a 15 year old and a 16 year old. Yep. And then I have a 20 and a 22 year old. Okay. I got, I got remarried, right? Okay. Um, like you, divorced. You know. Um, That's a fun ride, isn't I it? I was going to say. <laughs> I listened to your 30 minute soliloquy on divorce. I'm like, fuck, man. You're breaking me down. <laughs> like, like the single lowest point of my life for me, sure. Anna, it's like death. I I say I would gladly give you my other testicle. We didn't get to this, but I only have one and infertile, by the way, shooting blanks using your vernacular. Yep. Um, but I'd rather rather lose the other than having gone through the, the grief that is that. And, yeah. we, and we don't talk about it as a society. But um, but on the Shark Tank point, so two two reasons. One, with my kids, I would bond with my son. We watch every episode. This is no bullshit. One time we were talking and I was uh, and we were watching. He always liked Kevin O'Leary's deals. I'm like, you know, that's not reality. Like you can't, everybody would do royalty deals if they could. I would love to do royalty deals. And, and I remember I was like, you know, I'm a shark. He's like, you know, this is what dad does. He's like, <laughs> yeah, right, dad, you're a shark. I'm like, no, I'm a shark. I was like, I'm going to be a shark. I was like, what does it take to get on Shark Tank? And then I became obsessed with, what does it take? Right? And the second reason is, what's the greatest shorthand to say you're a good investor in America? It's that television show. So if you're an investor on that show, as an investor, not as like a celebrity guest, it's shorthand, right? So it's very efficient. And I had um, somebody in my world who believed that I was capable. He happened to get other sharks on, a couple of sharks. And we worked for a year of my life to get it done. No shit. Yep. And I had a, I had the courtesy of, you know, when somebody gives you a meeting and you're like, you know, it's the fit in cup of coffee, sun's going down. Yeah. Went to Hollywood, went to Sony studio. And I had to sit down with this guy, uh, Clay, who was the producer, Clay Newbill. Nice guy. And it was only supposed to be 15 minutes. And then it's, 40 minutes and then it's an hour it's a good sign it's a good sign and then um i just worked on it and then they gave me a shot did which, you enjoy it no i freaked out <laughs> <laughs> you, like, like it was i was i was so all right i'll tell you this story 
Are we going too long? No. Okay. All right. So the, we haven't I, even started talking about your balls. Yet. Okay. Right. Exactly. Fair. Ball. Please be be respectful. The only one left. Singular. Sorry. Singular. I yeah. apologize yes. to the other ball. Yes. So so I go. I go. We, my wife again. Sarah is amazing. We go to we go to we go we go to California. Right. And meanwhile, I lost fifty five pounds for this uh, endeavor. I was you know all fat and traumatized for, and, to, for be Shark, to be on Shark Tank because I don't want to watch re- reruns on CNBC forever. Looking at myself, I like had terrible posture and I put a little zapper on my back so I'd stand up straight. There was a lot of like over preparation had all my pithy notes but i don't know about you but i'm an insomniac it's just the one thing i can't you know to have I, you ever tried weed gummies i do i do <laughs> i know trust me i have not what state are we in over in Hina. okay try great. wolf 21 do you is- believe that crap though that they're any different they yes. all can only have 10 milligrams like they don't have like some secret melatonin in them i had i <clears throat> I've never just really been a like a weed guy. I mean, I grew up in Santa Cruz, California. I never, I never have. But you are capital. a weed guy, you're saying? Or? I never really have been. I have a very close friend, Mike Glover, who has a supplement called Wolf 21. And I just picked up Mike's book, by the way, prepared. Yep. Very excited about that. It's uh, And fuck, I'm so over the front of my skis by even talking about any of this. It's a different type of cannabinoid, cannabinoid, but it's CBN, not THC. There's a little bit of THC in it. And I, and I have struggled sleeping for a long time. And it works? It works. My struggle sleeping is if I wake up in the middle of the night and I get a full revolution on a thought, I'm fucking done. No, that's what I'm in. Honestly, I'll get up. First of all, I go to the bathroom all the time. But then I'll always look, is the sun up? Is the sun up? My poor yeah. wife is like, please. Like, I started doing marathons because I was like, I might as well use the 4 a.m. shift. It'd be worth a try. It has made an impact for me. I will get okay. six to eight hours of like very good sleep. And it, I don't wake up groggy, which is what I hate yeah. about some of the weed gummies. Yeah, it makes you like... I wake up and I'm like, am I actually... Is gravity still a thing? Like, are we on Earth? No. Like, <laughs> Right. Like, what's the purpose of this? <laughs> and so I'm good. half a human. Thank yeah. you. Well, so I will try that. I um, go on Shark Tank and then the night before, take an Ambien. I'd already been up a day. We go in the hotel room, right? Go to bed. Wife wakes up at like five alarm. It's a baby. Like, you ready? It's your big day. I'm like, I haven't slept. <laughs> I was like... It's, <laughs> this, is, this is humiliating, but I am... I, um, I had concocted in the middle of the night, I know what I'm going to do. We're in a hotel. I'm going to say I ordered the salmon. That I have food poisoning. There's a guy, Rohan. He, I know he lives only two miles away. I'm going to say Rohan will fill in for me. Like, this was the whole concocted plan. So my sweet wife, my sweet wife I tell her, I was like, I haven't slept. This is crazy. I'm going to call in. I don't even know why I would do this. And then she was like, she's like, oh, okay, baby, just take a shower. Like, go do your thing. So, so I said, just see how you feel. So I go, I take a shower sit on the floor of the shower and I'm like everything that we just talked about is playing in my head I'm like how pathetic to go from everything I went through like hard things right and I'm gonna like freak out over like a show I'm not gonna capitulate even though I've been up for two days and I've got a fresh ambient in me I was like what's what's it gonna I need inspiration to get me through this true story I was like Eminem Eminem can get me through this. I'm going to put him on. You're talking about the rapper or the, the uh, snacks? The rapper. All right. And I put um, Lose Yourself on a loop. There's a video of me <laughs> for two hours. <laughs> like, mom's spaghetti, nervous already. Yep. Right? Like, kind of things. <laughs> they're, doing my, they're doing my hair. <laughs> This around me. Fuck. And yeah. then I pulled, da- I don't know if you know Damon John. Damon, I Damon. know who he is. Yeah, yeah, so Damon, 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 uh, he's black, I'm white, but otherwise very similar. We grew up, you know, not far from each other. And uh, I pulled him into the dressing room and I was like, I got to be honest with you. I was like, I don't know why. I was like, I'm freaking out. I feel like total fraud coming from where I came from. I don't know why. And, and he, he, goes, he goes, well, I could say this on this, but he's like, he's like, let me tell you something. Don't listen to those motherfuckers. We, we know where we came from, what we've been through. Okay. And here's the only thing you got to remember. You belong here because you are here. You got here. That's it. Yeah. And I was like, ah, that's all right. That's pretty damn effective. I sit down, lights go on. I'm like, and then I froze. You know, <laughs> I was like, what happened to the speech? You know, and as we were going through it, you ever have, you have one of these moments in life and sort of, I, I realized like, what am, what am I talking about? I've done so many deals and I could do this in my sleep. Like literally, yeah. I know exactly about it. And then it, the switch just flipped and I like locked in and it was the most amazing 10 hours after that. I was and going to ask Laura, you Laura, how long it actually well, was. Well, actually 10 hours. And what's nice is Lori Grenier turns, this is one of, um, I talk about this too in the context of imposter syndrome so that we stop talking about it when we get more successful, right? It's like we can't admit it. 
Like, of course, admit it. I'm always doing hard things, as you always say, right? I've never had a day in my life where I don't have imposter right, syndrome. Right, And I'm always uncomfortable, as you say, right? Yeah. I'm always trying to be uncomfortable. It's so a it's, good thing. Right, exactly. If I get to a place where I'm like, I've got it all nailed, I'm like, oh, fuck. I'm irrelevant. I, me, I got me it. Too. Yeah. And now I'm complacent. Yeah. I'm, I'm you know, borderline obsolete. Yep. So Laurie Grenier, at the end of it, turns, this is, you know, at the end of the, I, I won the first pitch. Um, and Lori Grenier turns to me and she goes, Matt. <laughs> and she always put her at the end because she's like the den mother. She goes, Matt. Um, on a scale of um, one to ten, one to a hundred, that was a ninety-six. I think she said because nobody gets a hundred, but no one has walked in here in the ten years of Shark Tank and acted like they were there from the first day. And I just always tell that to say, think about how much your mind controls everything. Right on the one hand, yeah. I'm thinking about capitulating. On the other hand, you know that's the, uh, the experience. So. Amazing! So, so great. So it's just one day. No, so it was one day, and they filmed two episodes. It's te- it's ten pitches. It's a long ass day. But well, and this is what because <clears> I've <throat> done a little bit of. Yeah. I've been peripheral to that world, and for a forty four minute hour long show, because the rest of it's selling soap and Pepsi. Mm-hmm. I'm just. I mean, how long did it? So it's about an hour pitch. So per so person? each pitch can. I'd say the shortest pitch could would be like twenty eight minutes, and the longest <sighs> pitch. I'd say on average, I bet you the pitch is around you know forty minutes. So there's a ton of shit on the editing room floor. Not yeah, but uh, interesting. Uh, credit to them. When I watch it, I can't remember what was edited out. Really, it's it's that's fantastic. Yeah, man. and the other thing that surprised me is. There's no like mentorship where they're like, oh, okay, like let me tell you, like, <laughs> like I mean, I had some great nights. Kevin and I, Kevin O'Leary and I went out all night and got totally hammered. Like, I've had great, lovely Robert Herkovich's sweetheart. But when you get on the set, and now I know them better, obviously. I was amazed by there was no warm bath, you know, like, okay, well, this is how it's going to be. And then it just goes, but because it's everybody's money and they don't know who's coming out the door, it's like this primal thing takes over. They're just like animals. And I remember <laughs> sitting on the- Hence the <laughs> shark tank. Right. So, and then, I, and, and, and I was hoping there would be a degree of theater, you know, of orchestration to feel more comfortable. I'm sitting at the end and they put you at the end. I'm like, how am I supposed to get a word in edgewise? Yeah, you're probably so, the last to speak. Right. You're the last to speak. And, but then by the end of the day- you're like, all right, I can roll with this. I started to do it, and then uh, and then they brought me back again for another season. So for me to go from high school dropout government cheese to set a Shark Tank, rolling with Mark Cuban, yeah, it's pretty cool. I dig it. And then I was like, what next? <laughs> Actually, I had a, the hard the hard problem the second time I was on it. I remember talking to my wife. I said, here's my new challenge. I'm not nervous. I could do this in my sleep. And not only that, I'm going to behave completely different than I, the, the the first time. And I'm going to act like I'm I'm never going to be here again. That this is the last shot. They named me a recurring shark, but I was like, anything can happen, right? And um, and I I, I I thought about how I had to switch from a motivation system of like anxiety to one of pursuit of excellence because hmm. I couldn't get elevated for it, you know. And that's I'm sure you can relate to this. Yeah. Habituation can also lead to complacency, right? Hundred percent. So I'm always trying to like break out of habits and into un- discomfort because then they, I become complacent. But that was my my problem my second time around. So you kind of said it yourself. You go there and you're like, you know what? This is going to be my last time. What's next? What yeah. is next for you? So after I did that, I was like, what's better than being on Shark Tank? It's creating your own Shark Tank. So I partnered with the creator of the show, Mark Burnett, and uh, we created our own show, which was to speak to the 99% of Americans who are never going to have a patent, never have a Shark Tank creates a myth. I think the percentage is a little yeah, higher I was than gonna 99%. Say, I was, just, being gener- <laughs> just being generous for all the people with infomercials out there. Yeah. No, but it, you know, it, it does perpetuate a myth that to have a business, you need to have an invention, whereas most people will never be in front of a venture, right? Yeah. But uh, you have your coffee shop. Like, there's all every, lots of ways to have a business. We created a show that was to teach people how to um, buy a business, and it's called Business Hunters. It was an offshoot of House Hunters. I worked through the pandemic, you know, on this along with my book, and um, it's amazing. Got picked up by CNBC. I shot it over, you know, several months. Yay! And then the uh, they have a new leadership and they cancel all their shows. No shit. So I shot. It's this. like done in the can and they canceled it. Yep. Along with every other show. So the show that I shot, that I, yeah, exactly. And you know, I start my book with it. It's funny. Two things that start my book were end of things that end up getting canned. And then I, d- I kept it in because I was like, I think that's the moral of this story. Yeah, well, you have it's to keep to, it in. It's, it's to model bouncing back, right, and extracting value from 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 setbacks. So, yeah, this was supposed to start airing in September. Oh. I was, I, it was like the love of my life. Now this show is like an orphan that just floats in the universe, you know, all shot, all the episodes. And uh, Do you but, guys own the rights to it? I don't own the rights. But then- 
was going to say, I have but ideas. Then, well, then we can, we can roll with your ideas. So I'm going to tell you the punchline. Because I do believe this. Every action has an equal and opposite reaction. The same thing is true for crisis. Every crisis has an equal and opposite opportunity. But it's incumbent upon us to look for it, right? It's not rhetoric. Like, if I don't have that mindset, I'll never see the opportunity. But if I do, I'm like, you know what? What would be even better than partnering with somebody on your show? Having your own production studio mm -hmm. where you own the show. So I partnered with them, two guys, Gary Vaynerchuk, Eric Wattenberg, and we launched our own reality production company where now I can create my own show unilaterally and hopefully never have it get canceled again. So... And that's just generally how I do things. Like a setback happens, I'll extract more value from it. Yeah. I had a $200 million SPAC during a pandemic, and then I had to shelve it when the market turned. But, you know, now I'm on CNBC all the time talking about public markets. Before, I didn't know crap. Yeah. I want to get your show. What's though. your idea? What's your What's your idea? Come on. <sighs> well. I hope it involves shooting, because I, I, I came to Montana. And I mean, all right. Let's, let's morph this idea into a James Bond scenario. Somewhere <laughs> on a thumb drive is your show. We're going to have to identify <laughs> where it is, Matt. <laughs> Then we're going to do a very thorough and robust planning cycle, and then you and I will Halo insert in. No, I want to get your goddamn show, and I want to take it to a streaming service and sell that shit. I think that'll probably happen. Yeah, but I, it's I, like the – it's well, you know what's going to help you? The writing strike. I, There's I, going to be a void in content. I thought so, but I actually think the studios have been waiting for the the, the networks have been waiting for the writing strike. So you they think can, they have enough banked? Because here's the problem. I think the um, let's just call it the streaming wars. Yeah. Right, which drove everybody to lose their mind and overpay for content. Yeah. There's a backlog of that content, and you're and uh, there's a backlog of old content. I think what might be happening in the near future is there's going to be a void of new content. I think that's true. I think if, if this goes on long enough, I just yeah. think that uh, a lot of parties benefit probably from the strike because they get to use content that they had and they don't have to spend money. All right, they we're, we're going back to the so original idea. We're haloing in and getting this motherfucker. It's I, on I a like thumb that. drive somewhere. Do you know somebody with those skills? I do. You Michael can fly the plane. He doesn't know how to yet, but we can teach him. He's but part he, of the operation. Just figure it out. Yeah, totally. He used to do error. electronic work on aircraft. What's the difference between that and a pilot? I don't know. All right, excellent. <laughs> he could certainly he could certainly type up the uh, AAR, right? Yeah. yeah, I'll just ask Chat GPT how to fly an airplane. Do you like that? Perfect. I'm drop an acronym. Oh, no, right he just was like right over his head. He's like, <laughs> not, I, I got it. I was okay, right got it. There you, with you were rolling like, with me. Yeah, I was, was like, good. come on. What the fuck? He just asked Chat GPT. Yeah. Well, all my problems can be solved with the AI. <laughs> Eventually, that actually might be the case, but then right after that, Skynet is going to become self-aware, and then we're all going to get butt-fucked by robots. What's that's your, how that's going what to What is your take on AI? What an amazing tool. Yeah. And before I even talk about AI, I have to remind people that I'm an idiot, so they shouldn't take what I say about AI seriously at all, and I have just very recently started playing around with it. Like, I was just down in Austin doing uh, – I went down there to go do two podcasts. Uh, the first one was uh, Rogan, and I saw – uh, an article about Mid Journey, which is a yeah, photo. amazing. Yeah, I had never logged on to it. Yeah, and so I started playing around with it, and it it doesn't take a whole lot. And the reason I was thinking about it was, you know, the the thumbnails for YouTube for a podcast, the the science is pretty definitive. Like you need a compelling image for people to click. It's click through, and then how much time are they going to watch? It's a bastard to try to find an image with the person and exactly kind of what you're looking for. Hmm. When you can just create a prompt, and the more prompts that you do, I've already figured out, like, oh, okay, like, the language you use on this is actually really important. And the specific, uh, specificity that you can use, like, create an image on this landscape with this lens on this camera with this photographer behind. I'm like, holy shit, this is insane. And then I, I've been messing around with ChatGPT for maybe about a month. I think it's an amazing tool. But I also think that it has the ability to get way out in front of us. And the, uh, my business partner comes from the tech world. And so basically, it's, it's hilarious. Our, there's a definite work share. I tell people, like, if it involves ones and zeros, you need to go talk to Denver. Because I, I, I can, like, set up Instagram on your phone. But if you need to talk about, like, adding a button or code, and get the fuck away from me. I'm not even allowed in the electric room because I want to, like, flip the switches. I'm just fascinated. I'm like, that's green and red. Like, ah, I have to push it. But he... You know, we talk about is it. like there's probably a reason why everybody involved in the inception and creation of AI is warning people that we need to slow down, that we need to probably take a breath, and nobody's listening. So, did you hear about the drone thing? Oh, I did. Yeah, did you hear about this? The Air Force did it. I did. They saw that, yeah. and then he, then he killed the uh, when the, the AI tower. realized that it was the controller that was limiting its high score, it just nuked him. Not like with a nuke, but it yeah it decided to kill the controller. Like, hey guys. 
Is anybody else paying attention to this case study? (laughs) This is a really, really good case study. That was the first one that got me to like, all right, because I've been mostly dismissive. Like calling everybody. AI realized that you set up the parameters of a game and that the human operator was limiting its ability to have a high score. So let's just take that off the board. I'm not here for that shit. (laughs) So (laughs) now, apparently, I'm looking it up. The guy came out. He said he misspoke about that. Yeah. that I had a that, feeling. That didn't that actually. actually yeah, but you know what? Though blah, 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 Chat blah. GPT probably wrote that second article. It's yep. like the AI was like, "Oh no, we're not no, looking. We good can't here. get this out." <laughs> <laughs> the AI yeah. that taught another AI to read the newspaper and inform itself on opinion was like, "Hey, we got a red flag here. We're looking bad." It's like, cool. Gen mm-hmm. up a new article. Let's spin this. Yeah, my my, um, my view on AI overall is uh, is uh, I actually think it's going to be the great equalizer. And the greatest wealth creator of my lifetime. I mean, if you take a step back, you think about if if you were somebody laboring away in Indonesia and you had a skill gap, you know, you didn't understand marketing or yeah. you didn't have the pedigree, nobody's paying any attention to you. Now the creator, now the creator can go ahead and be the business maker. Whereas before they might have been a commodity that was hired, right? Oh, I'll yeah. pay you to design my website. Now the guy's like, wait, I can just go ahead and launch the business myself. So I think um, I th- a second thing, I, the um, the scaremongering, although there's some truth to it, I think does make those people who tend to be compliant and wait for the official word to come that they should embrace something, those are the ones who should be acting early because they could be the ones that could benefit the greatest. People in marginalized groups, whatnot. Like, so my view is you should run headfirst into it. It's an incredible with, uh, wealth creator, but it is a bit of a race about who gets there first. Yeah. So like you, I love that you were playing around with it. I've, I've gotten incredibly tactical. Like on the weekends now I shut down and I play around with all these different tools. Yeah. And then I decided to, to make this less abstract. I just wrote an article for CNBC showing how, if I was broke again, how I would use $100 to create a business that would create $10,000 a month. And I mapped out the steps, um, whether or not one can do it or not. It was basically to paint a it's picture. An awesome thought process. Yeah, I just That's figured, really- I figured, let me show, right? Because I do think for those who are, who are like uh, inclined to be spooked, they're going to miss the opportunity. Yeah. And there's a chance you could launch a business right now and make 100 grand a month. I really do believe you could. Well, you can be spooked about anything, too. Right, a lot true. of it has context, like how much exposure do you have to said thing? Um, people are scared to death of the concept of skydiving. I've been jumping for 24 no, years. No, that's, no, that's legit. It's The fear of heights <laughs> just, is legit, yeah. for sure, but the danger and risk associated with it is far blown out of proportion. But they they don't actually even have a percentage of a toe in the pool, but it can seem super scary. And that's what I was thinking about AI from viewing it from a distance. I also I, – I'm looking at it from the perspective of how can I task – shed and recover yep. more time for myself. Well, that's exactly, that's what all humans do with innovation, right? Yeah. Like, the elevator operator is probably really scary when the first time somebody got in alone, yeah. right? And they're like, actually, that worked out. I mean, I do worry a little bit about people who take what they find on the internet as gospel. You know, when I talk to smart people about AI and they're like, well, what happens when an AI teaches another AI to create a volume of information that's a literal tsunami that's untrue and it gets the cart gets out in front of the horse? I'm like, okay. Like, I can see that. I mean, I don't actually think that the Skynet yeah. moment is, is, is impending upon us, but I can understand that danger and risk. But a lot of that comes back for me, the realization that we walk around Earth surrounded by some pretty dumb people sometimes. Well, that, that's why and I- they have access to the fucking internet. Right. <laughs> well, so, very true. I have a counterintuitive take a little bit on the truth, though. I think the truth has already been completely devalued, that people now brag about their ability to manipulate it, right? In politics and otherwise, mm. right? So we're already, at a, we're already at a tipping point in civilization that could destroy us, which is there no, there's no truth anymore. We're like the age of unreason. But now that AI is here, now we can't trust anything. Therefore, we must need a system to pr- prove the veracity of everything. And I think in a very short period of time, or else we could have like Banana Republic takeover type situations, we are going to have a, probably a blockchain based system that will have to validate all images and video and eventually text that f- with the source, the author. Yeah. And I think that's amazing. And so I actually think AI amplifies the problem so much that the solution is around the corner and we were already fucked anyway, since truth didn't matter anymore. I was having that conversation, I think it was last weekend, talking about, you know, Mid Journey as an example. Yeah. And there was uh, actually Michael had pulled it up before. There was a an AI photo that won a photography contest, and it's like, man, the in, the impact on actual artists, that's a rough one. I mean, they'll they'll we'll figure it out. Yeah, that you is know, a rough one. It might yeah. actually though, it might actually drive an, an immense amount of value. You know, you look at things that were valueless twenty years ago now that are priceless, right? Or it might drive a whole new ecosystem where I actually want the guy who took 
two months to make this, and I'll pay you more than this fake AI image that I think looks that's even true. better. I, I, I think that's true even with writing. We're afraid that like it's going to eliminate um, writing. Actually, what it's going to do is make it most people lazy and settle for mediocrity so that when you do something excellent, yeah, it's I've, used, stand above. I've used chat GPT. I'm screwing around. I'm like, make me a viral tweet or do my newsletter for me. And then it always underperforms yeah. compared to what I can do. I'm a writer and a thinker, right? So I think mediocrity, I actually think it's great because most people will settle for crap. And then if you have uh, skills superior, now imagery is a little harder. I, I mean, I think people who make decks and stuff like that, like it's hard to think how. Michael pulled up some music. Yeah. What was it? Oh, yeah. It, was it like got a, like, this song got like 36 million Drake downloads before yeah, they it was the Drake things. song. Yeah, I'm backing a I'm backing an AI startup called Sound Labs. And, and here's the thing. It's like, yeah. okay, that's an interesting problem. Yeah. <laughs> no, no, that that is. And the song was great. And like, you yeah. know, they're. But I think it's what you said. We'll have to reveal whether something was AI generated. And then there'll be a premium on the thing that was created by I think humans. that's the key is being able to have a watermark used in the broadest of terms, exactly. a separation right. between... That's why I use blockchain, because yeah. the, that seems like the, the Excel sheet in the sky that you can prove authorship, yeah. that it'll be something like that. I like your use of the word watermark, but so, I don't know, I'm mostly bullish, but most importantly for anybody out there who's, so, you know, instead of doing what I did and sell flowers, like, you can sell shit on Shopify and stand Dude. up a business in, like, 10 minutes. It will do... Again, it's like the prompting. The more that you interface with this, too, the better you understand the language that it's looking for. See, forward. you're techie, though. See, you're talking about prompting. I mean, using the nomenclature. Hash like, Hash slash. Know. Imagine. I think you have a whole <laughs> secret life. <laughs> I don't, but I'm fascinated by this stuff. Um, I, I don't know. I think it's cool. Yeah. I you know, people too. are scared to death of aliens. I'm like, fucking bring that shit on. Like, let's. It'd be amazing. No, I'm scared of that. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> they could have already destroyed us if yeah, they wanted no, to, if no. we're not alone. I love innovation. Yeah. Tell me about your book. Why'd you decide to write one, by the way? Uh, because I, I feel like, so you get to a certain place in life and you start showing up in the world as the byproduct of everything you've done. So if you look at me, I'm a guy on Shark Tank, you presume I have wealth, I teach at Harvard Business School, all these things. And that is very uninteresting to me. What's interesting to me is what I witnessed when I was 16, where what's interesting is the pain I carry about powerlessness and in the empathy that stokes and understanding how coming from that background will make you very ill-equipped to go for it that you conjure all these reasons why you're not good enough, not equipped, even though you might have tremendous potential. I fortunately believe, I think I hacked into the codes by, through self-sabotage when I was young, the, the high school decision. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to use the authority that I've collected in society that makes people listen to me, all these different things, right? And use that very specifically to talk to those who aren't self-possessed, who it doesn't come naturally to go all in. And let me appropriate this very militaristic idea, burn the boats, which has imbued with authority because it goes back to the beginning of recorded history. Every society, every culture has a burn the boat story of a general who was outnumbered. It's not just Cortez, he had a better marketing campaign. It actually goes back way before him to Sun Tzu and the uh, Old Testament. Let me take those words and let me recast the boats as the metaphorical boats in our lives that make us hold two opposing thoughts at the same time. Plan A, the, the real dream, and then what we're told is prudent, which is the retreat, the backup plan, which we yeah. do to our kids, right? Like, that's good. You want to be Taylor Swift, but make sure you get an accounting degree. And so I wanted to write a book for the anxiety-ridden, the angst-laden, those who suffer from imposter syndrome and show, hey, I did it. And I did it through a series of, of decisions that self-sabotage my retreat. And let me show you a way to work through all the things that hold you back. And let me present to you case studies that took me a damn long time to, to work on from people I worked with, Scarlett Johansson's my partner, I mean, NFL coaches. Let me all show you the common denominator that they had to break through and let go of those metaphorical boats and use science and research because everyone rejects this. I need a backup plan. Even when I talk to military guys, sometimes they say, well, that's contrary to everything we're taught. I'm like, no, it's not true. The, the backup plans you have are tactical. We burn the boats for goals. I'm going to win that war. I'm going to take that hill, mm -hmm. right? And so that's why I wrote the book. I worked on it during the pandemic for two years. When I wake up every morning and I get a DM from somebody who is completely different in a socioeconomic way, right? It could be a black grandmother or an immigrant or a woman and say, I connect with you. That feels like I'm a life worth living. Like I created meaning out of what I've been through. Because as you could tell from our conversation, like it doesn't matter. Like that stuff doesn't matter. But yeah. that fucking matters, right? So that's why I wrote the book. How the hell did you bump up against Scarlett Johansson? Um, she loves Shark Tank. And wild. Yeah. So, so definitely uh, just one of those moments. I've always been a huge fan. The movie Lucy is amazing. I always love this idea that we only use a small percentage of our brain. Oh, that's the one where they like traffic this weird blue shit. Yeah, blue shit. Yeah. I just, yeah. It's so funny. She always laughs yeah. like you and my dad. You know, like that's the, I love I that. actually like that movie too. I it's love that movie. Yeah. And then we ended up meeting one night. 
We had an amazing um, uh, dinner, my wife and her and uh, Colin. And she's so awesome. We're like, we're jamming on Shark Tank. And she was like, uh, hey, let's go on a double date. And then uh, I was like, yeah, sure, you know, whatever. She's like, how's Thursday? And then we hung out. And then we became very, very close. So we um, hang out with uh, her and Colin. We've gone on vacations together. But um, she she was carrying around this idea. She's an entrepreneur deep mm-hmm. down, but she also is this phenomenal, you know, actor, right? Yeah. But she was carrying around this idea for this uh, 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 skincare line, and could never um, uh, never put it into production because she hadn't scaled herself, right? She didn't have a partner, and so we worked together to identify a partner. She launched a business called The Outset. It's now at every Sephora in the United States. It's fucking awesome. And yeah, so I love doing, I have a lot of those stories in a book. Yeah. Of them where I got to play a slight role in helping unlock somebody. And I wanted my book to do that writ large, if that makes sense, right? And, and do it in a way where I wouldn't be cast aside, like, you're just a rich white guy. What do you have to tell me? And so a lot of the things we talked about today, not all of them, um, I because I can't, I can't even read sections of my book, particularly like the divorce. I wanted to share enough vulnerability that people would, it would ring authentic. When we go on Instagram, we're like, failure is good. I'm like, no, it's not. I hate fucking failure. <laughs> like, yeah. But failure is you useful. You can learn from well, it. I was say, failure is useful, yeah. but we use this very simplistic language. The other part I hate about Instagram is there's this um, arc that everyone's now had to embrace. I, would, I had an ego, or I stumbled, and I was redeemed. Now I have the answers to the test. Let me share them. And I was, I'm also 22. Right, exactly. I'm 22. Fucking I never really had a fucking job. Stripper wisdom right. on and a goddamn fortune by the way, cookie. Right, and my course will be 1199 if yeah. you want the intro version. So I wanted to demonstrate that life is a series of regression and progression, right? Constantly successful people, if you tell the truth, and that if I could put all that together in a narrative way, a lot of these business books are lazy. I think they're just like reference books. That's not how people learn. I want to use storytelling. And so... Anyway, that's the mission I'm on with with burn the boats and just convincing people to go all in. And what does it look like? How'd you meet your first wife? Uh, we worked together. How long were you married for? We were married for uh, eight years. Did you find it hard to connect with her when you first met? And I asked that based on the lens of you listening of listening to you talk about your your relationship with your mom and the burden associated with that. It seemed like you kind of went through the early portions of your life as a singleton. Yeah. I think it's hard for anybody to connect with me, to be honest with you. you know, like, so was, I, I was a. Do you make it hard, or do you think it's naturally hard? I think, like, and only recently did I not did I stop looking over the shoulder for the boogeyman. When you broke break, when your amygdala is uh, enlarged like a grapefruit, yeah, and you only feel soothed through adrenaline and crisis, it's very hard to relate to because other people are like, like, where's where's the boogeyman? And I think. Uh, it's taken me a long time to even get to that place. How old are you now? I'm 48. Okay. And and I think I also made a very conscious decision. I don't know if you feel this way. We tend to beat ourselves up that we have to extinguish the trauma, the PTSD. We need to get some baseline of you know lack of anxiety. I got to the point in saying, I don't think I'm going to be able to do it in this lifetime. But I don't even think I want to. Because when I meet a single mother who I watch them going to college at night, their their pain is so raw and real with me that it's almost crippling, right? Like I could, sometimes I hear these stories, I can pass out. I, I think that's a gift and something that I don't want to extinguish. So I pivoted from somebody trying to like, I don't know, heal to saying to to be okay with a place of semi wounded, because that's where I think my empathy comes from. Um, and for a long time, I was unreconciled. I, for a while, I wouldn't accept that there was damage. Yeah. And then I got to a point where I was like, all right, I'm gonna I'm gonna keep that slightly fresh. I don't think you can extinguish it. I think it's actually, it's a, it might sound on paper like a super worthwhile goal. Like I'm going to yeah. go and meditate in the forest right, and have exactly. my microdose of mushrooms. My and, micro, everyone's microdosing oh, these days. Fuck. Are you microdosing? No. I've Everyone, never, everyone's inviting me to microdose. I macrodose fucking caffeine. That's what I'm talking about. Woo! <laughs> never sleep. Exactly. We're, <laughs> we're men. Have shitty By the way, business ideas about chocolate yeah, rims on Porsches. Yeah. Forget all this mom <laughs> stuff I talked about. <laughs> no healing. Post-traumatic stress disorder is a term that drives me fucking batshit. Mm. I don't think it's a disorder. I think if you got sick and didn't get a fever, that's a disorder. It's your body reacting improperly. And I can only talk about it through the lens of my own experience. If you go and you touch war, it's going to touch you back. That's the way that I talk about it. That's the – I don't even think – for me personally, I don't feel that war was traumatic. But for people who do feel that way – it's not a disorder. They're asking you to go do very exceptional things that most people will never have to think about, process, or bear the weight of. And it's going to leave a mark on you. Like the fingerprint of that is going to be there 
but what are you going to do with it? I actually think my experiences and the trauma that I have been through in my life have made me a better version of myself because it's not about a disorder. It's about the growth that can come from those things. It's I, this this Herculean journey of just trying to extinguish all trauma for your life. I don't think it's possible. Grow from it and do something with it that makes you a better version on the other side of it. And maybe that's just simply changing their vernacular in, in people's minds. And again, I'm not a fucking psychologist or psychiatrist, but I, one of the things I struggle with being a part of the veteran community is listening to veterans in their own broken toy narrative. Like if you're talking about yourself that way, how do you expect anybody else to see you in any other light? Like put that shit down, mm. stack up those blocks and like walk, make them into a stairway and like, and fucking get over the wall. That's, but but you, victim narrative, or are you saying more bro, like perpetually broken, no one will love me kind of? There's uh, both, and that honestly, and as much as it sucks to say, there's a financial incentive to be broken hmm. as a veteran, especially oh, when it comes to I mean. the VA system and the rating system. You know, it's uh, if you get a 100% rating for post traumatic stress, and you were to go back to the VA and say, I am doing exceptional, I am now maybe 50% rated, they would pay you less. The more damaged you are in the VA rating system, the more money you make. Wow, that's kind of. I mean, I get it, and I don't get it, right? I mean, what, it's, how well, else, it's weird, right? It's how like, else should it be done? Right? Well, it's like and, what kind of chessboard are we setting up here? Yeah. Like, what What are we defining? Like, people need. There's an economic requirement for life. A lot of people coming out of the military thought about only their military service or what they wanted to do when they were in. So they're a little behind the power curve when they're thinking about what they want to do when they get out. I was in that same boat. All I wanted to do since I was 11 was be a SEAL, and then. You go in one day and get your DD-214, that piece of paper, and you're like, oh, shit, I did not put a commensurate amount of effort into what was going to be next. So I get that. So there's this economic requirement. Well, here's a system that the more I talk about how damaged I am, the more money I could potentially get paid. And I'm not saying everybody does that, but any veteran from any veteran group out there knows goddamn well that they're, they know somebody who is fucking gaming the system. There are forums online that coach people to getting a 100% rating. It's like change the narrative. Do mm. something with it. That's that, – I just don't think you can extinguish that trauma. I don't think you can totally get rid of it. Do you feel like you have PTSD technically? I When I went in and I got uh, – when I went through my VA rating, what I told myself, the deal I made with myself was I was going to answer the questions honestly. But the questions are very broad. Now, like, do you ever have nightmares? Sure. But sometimes it's about a fucking clown climbing up from underneath the bed that I'm sleeping in, right? That scares the shit out of me more than an ISIS dude with an AK. I'll tell you that shit right now. Um, do you ever, uh, do your th thoughts ever drift back to uh, something that happened overseas or an obligation or requirement at work? Yeah. And sometimes it's about having to make a life and death decision in a quarter of a second. But other times it's about laughing so goddamn hard about something that would make no sense in any environment ever because everything about that environment was nonsensical to include what they were asking us to do and we were dying laughing. It's everything in between those. So the questions themselves are not very precise. Got it. So the, <clears throat> if, you don't, if you ask imprecise questions, you're going to get imprecise answers. So do I feel like I am damaged from war? No. I think I'm a better version of myself because of my experiences. And I, and I think that's possible for most people. I know there are some people that it scrambles their eggs, and I don't know what to do about that. And I think, um, for me at least, the goal has always been self-awareness, how to cultivate the confidence to look within and not be afraid of what I find. I think if you have eyes wide open, you can mostly deal with everything, which is a little bit different than saying, I need to disassociate. It was interesting on your episode where you were talking to the Medal of Honor winner. And, oh, yeah, Plumlee. Fascinating. Fuck. Fascinating. For how he told the story, yeah, it wasn't just an efficiency around telling because he's told it a million times because it actually was still animated and fresh, but it was very, you know, even keel. And I was thinking if somebody was listening to that they might say, "Well, that's disassociation. You might have some type of PTSD." Very laissez-faire approach right? to telling you, like, oh, right. and then I picked up his and grenade then, and threw it back at yeah, him. Yeah, and then, but you know, like, <laughs> and I, I was actually thinking as as I wonder what a psychologist would say watching that interview and thinking like, what the hell is he supposed to be doing going yeah. through that? Right? Like, we all got to survive yeah. and, and accommodate what we've been through. And who's to say his way of dealing with it is wrong, is wrong versus right, right? Right? Exactly. You know? So for me, I settled on a place of saying. 
as long as my eyes are open. That's the thing I don't, right? We don't want to be fooled by ourselves, right? I don't yeah. want to be, I don't want to be uh, blinded by anything. Like, so I seek um, discovery and awareness, but I got to a place where I was saying, actually, it is, it is an asset. Empathy is an asset. And I do think if I quarterize, like I said before, encased the trauma, it wouldn't be fresh anymore, right? So I'm glad I can't read certain pages in my own book because that means somebody will feel that, right? Like, it, like I literally can't read some of those pages. Let me ask you this. Was it hard for you to write those pages or did they pour out of you? No, it's really hard. And I revi- I mean, I, I have a pa- I have a small section in the in the book about divorce. I don't like talking about divorce much because yeah. for a variety of reasons, like the language you use can make you sound like a victim. You know, yeah. it's just it's very important when you have children to just establish a baseline and do what's right with them yeah. be, and be protective of the dynamic. You talked about this the other day, but um, but I put the page in in the context of when I had cancer and I had my testicle cut off, I showed up. My number one concern was everyone was now going to tear me apart. Um, I thought I was going to go back to that apartment eating government cheese. And I was working at the Jets. And I remember meeting my HR director on a corner of Manhattan to change my life, uh, my life insurance beneficiary because I didn't want anybody in the office to see that I was about to go under surgery. And then I got surgery and I woke up with the, you know, for the painkillers. And I was like, how do I show everybody I'm not defeated? And I went to work the next day. Um, there was a dinner with all the Jets coaches. And I had an ice pack on my groin, right? And mm-hmm. I was like, and everyone's looking at me. And now in hindsight, they're like, what the, what, what the hell is this? <laughs> right? Like for me, I was like, I'm so tough. And then I told them, um, I was like, I have a toast to make, everybody. I have a new motto. I want to roll out to you. Here's half the balls, twice the man. Fuck, that's a good bumper sticker. Yeah, by the way, I have it. I can still wear it. So I have a. I wear it around my neck, actually. I have you I, ever made a t-shirt with that? I, know, I will. That'll really? Crush. No, no. Well, do you Michael have, wear that you shit. Have, I turn into dog tags. Half the ball is twice the man. <sighs> All right. But, I've but never I, actually worn dog tags. Right. I issued them in the <laughs> Navy. I never wore <laughs> Right. Well, now I do. Yeah. No, I don't mean to appropriate your symbols from your people. No, that's but, fine. Uh, but, but thank you. Thank you. Yeah. But um, so I tell this story in the context of, and I love it. Some guy was giving, doing a podcast about the book. He's like, I got to that point. I'm like, oh, here's another bro telling a bro story about hustle culture. And then I say, um, I look back at that now and I cringe because anybody who worked for me at the time, short of getting amputated, you better conceal whatever it is you're going through as a leader, right? (laughs) If you have more than one ball, you better shut the hell up, right? Right. So, and then I got divorced and it was, it was. What was the time period between the two? um, That's a great question. It was probably six years, maybe. Oof. Yeah. But, um. The point of that, when I went through it and I realized the magnitude of the way this is like a death, that it, it, cancer didn't even rate. I mean, to be honest with you, I thought it was kind of neat that I hear I am, I'm a guy with a GD, one ball, probably the only guy in America. You know what I mean? I, I just, once I survived, right? And um, I, it made me feel regretful for the times I denied empathy to other people thinking that I had been healed when I wasn't. And also that, that um, it's okay to create space for people to be a little bit broken. And I put that in the in the book because I had an epiphany that night alone in a hotel room, with you know fragile and tears streaming down my cheeks, and very desperate. And I had an epiphany, felt the closest thing to God, saying, "Matthew, you are okay." And it triggered a reevaluation of my life, saying, "Technically, I was born whole, right? We're not dependent upon anybody else to be whole." And I need to rebuild my self-esteem, not because, uh, you know, I'm Doogie Howser and the kid who always does everything early, which is how I saw myself. I saw a divorce as a mark of Cain, like yeah. a stink that you can't shake. Yeah, to, like it's going to define you. Exactly. To realizing, like, I don't need anyone's validation, only my own. And I need to rebuild my sense of self-esteem, not through accolades. And, and, and you know what I mean? And it, and it caused a whole reappraisal. I put that in the book. And... And then I regretted it. <laughs> and then when the book came out, I get a phone call from a magazine, totally not following my own advice of Burn the Boats, by the way. I get a call from a magazine. <laughs> like, I, I, by the way, I asterisk the shit out of my book. I barely can follow my own advice. But I get a call from a magazine saying, we love your book. We want to excerpt a part. I'm like, cool. We want to do the part about that, divorce. I'm like, really? And I said no. Would, the book had already been was already at the printer. Mm-hmm. And I remember going for a, for a walk and saying like, I'm completely not following my own advice, right? I had already committed. It's at the printer. It doesn't matter. It's in the world. And I did it because I want to make a gift to myself, right? Anyway, fast forward. I get a message from somebody saying, um, this is the first night that I am alone with um, out my children. And I am desperate. That's but a I, rough night. I said, but I read your book. And your book spoke to me. <sighs> and then um, I'm so glad that you did. 
And uh, it helped me get through it. I sent him this long message about what his life is going to be like in, a, in another couple of years, right? And then I get his address and I send him a note and I say, page 54 was written for you. So there's no point in that story other than I'm grateful that I did. It did not pour out for me. That's what you asked me if it poured out. But I do think if you want to make grief useful, you make a, grif- a gift of it. Yeah. And if you're in a position of power like we are, authority or, or a platform, talking about stuff that people don't always want to talk about is our cross to bear. But think about the gift I just made to some random guy I never met who was alone for the first night without his kids. That first night is rough. Yeah, I barely made it to the hotel that I stayed at because I was crying so hard I could barely drive my car. Yeah, and I it mean, didn't get any better the next day, no, or or the <laughs> next or the next year. Did you ever think you would get married again? Um, it no. took me a while before I even actually considered that thought. No, I didn't. Ish, but it's funny how hope springs eternal, right? And how we're able to say, "Well, this is different," uh, and then. I definitely made a series of very great decisions. <laughs> like I'm proud of myself about how I met my my partner. Mm-hmm. Um, but my wife now, Sarah, is the greatest force multiplier of my entire life. Like you know, guys be like, I want to thank my wife. You know, like mm-hmm. no, there is no Shark Tank or no TV show. There's no book without without my partner. So, but I to, of course I didn't think it would happen again. Yeah, I was in the same boat as well. Which I think is the na- you're like if there if the Marianas Trench is deep, you're about eight orders of magnitude deeper than that it's not necessarily your first thought right you're like hooray I'm gonna, how do i re-en- on to the next right, how do i re-enlist this yeah. is gonna be uh how long ago did you get remarried uh i have been married for almost a year oh congratulations yeah that's great yeah how so you it'll be a year- amazing. amazing happier than i've ever fucking been i actually feel like i need to burn every book that i ever read that had a definition of happiness in it and rewrite a definition of happiness that is more appropriate it's interesting, right? Yeah. I, I I feel I my wife is my literally my best friend. Same. And we go everywhere and we have the time of our lives. And it's so incredibly fulfilling. And I never thought I'd circle back to that, right? Yeah. Like Well, it's you there's no way you're looking through any lens to see the horizon on that one. No. I, I was trying to make it through the next minute of the clock ticking over. Yeah. So, did you ask the doctors to keep your other ball? I did actually. More importantly, because that would be a dope keychain to accompany the dog tags. Wait, what's that little vegetable? Is it lychee or whatever that floats in water that looks like a ball? I know. I always Michael? want to go. <laughs> wait, can <laughs> you see. wait? Wait, wait. No, here's the thing. Here's the prompt. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what is the ball? Yeah. What is the vegetable that looks like a human testicle? I don't Chat know. Chat GPT five. I'd switch to the five for that. Yeah, yeah. They uh, upgraded one. Yeah. Or maybe use Bard. And this might be a job for uh, Google. Yeah. I don't know if it's a vegetable. I feel like it's lychee or something. Come on, don't Let's fail see. us, Michael. Come on. Uh, Romanesco broccoli? I don't think that's it. Uh, all right. Well, let's let him do his thing for a second. Uh, all right. Uh, all right. I'm, I'm just saying. I'll keep looking. Yeah. I'm just saying. It could be okay. a very well, bespoke well let, me, well, let me tell you what happened. So when I went to go get surgery, this is a very rapid thing, right? I had a pain in my groin. and They I, move on this shit quick. I have know, another they, friend who had right? the same situation. I think it was like. 48 hours uh, yeah, maximum? max, right. Yeah. So, uh, so I, I have a pain I've been ignoring, like a lot of guys, right? I assume it's something else, starting with blue. And then you uh, you end up going, right? Yeah. And then they're like, they have a look on their face. And then it's like, it's go time. Yeah. And I'm like, can I, it's an important part of your anatomy. Like, yeah, they're like, I, hey, clear your schedule. Right, they're like, we're going to, we're like, what? Like, tomorrow? And so, um, but as I got in, you know, gala's humor, as you do, right? They're they're about to uh, take me away. And I'm like, hey, um, hey, do you have nudicles? Fuck the, yeah. The guy was like, you? I'm like, you know, the Doberman pinchers. Like, yeah. can I get that? And they're like, they're like, oh, you mean prosthetic testicle? I'm like, yeah, right. Also so get, known as a nudicle. Stay right. up with the current vernacular. <laughs> right. So exactly. <laughs> yeah. So then the guy. Fucking doctor. Right, 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 you? Right, where have you been? On the internet? Yeah. So, uh, and then uh, <laughs> this young guy, no sense of humor. And he goes, um, we do actually. Would you, would you like that? I'm like, how the fuck did I not research this? And, I go, and he goes, he goes, uh, he goes what size? <laughs> I'm like you ever, you ever played pool? I was like, Let's go eight ball. Huge. I want to be. In, I want to be. In, I want to make up for lost time. I want to be incapacitated. Yeah. yeah, like, yeah. So, so I was like, how about they? How about symmetry? Yeah. <laughs> let's let's just go for symmetry. Yeah. So yeah. So I do in fact have that. Which uh, in fact, when I I remember when I went to a group therapy because you're supposed to do that, right? And I, I a couple of takeaways from the group. Everybody. Um. This is no disrespect for anybody out there, but 
I don't think it's the most flattering part of my anatomy. And so everyone, there was a lot of, you know, mourning of disfigurement. And I yeah. was the only guy that had gotten to prosthetic. And, and I honestly, I felt like th this is my frame of reference. It's a cancer that uh, in my cohort is 99% survivable. Yeah. I caught it early. I, I, I witnessed people die on 9-11. You know what I mean? I'm here. In the scheme of things, yeah. I don't feel like a victim. And I got a month of radiation. It has left me infertile, bad, but I'm here, you know? And so I don't know. I've never been able to just like lob onto that, you know, victim narrative. Again, all due respect to anybody else, but yeah. my own, my own journey. Um, it's not about what happens to you. It's about how you receive it and what you do with it. It really is. And it doesn't mean that we all, we all have moments of being victimized. I think it's that we, you could separate being a victim from being victimized. We should all allow ourselves to mourn, you know, the pain. Yeah. But I, I reframed my thinking from, the, I remember there, uh, uh, going to that group and there was a lot of like, why me? And I, I remember the implicit. There's no fucking answer to that well, question. Well, right, not only that, implicit in that statement, if we say that uh, every 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 bad scenario has a statistic, right? In the case of testicular cancer, it's 7,000 people a year will be diagnosed with this disease, right? If I say to my, if my conclusion is why me, that means somebody else must take my spot in line. And then the answer is, right, so are, are they better off? Or am I better off when I have already been through a lot? I have mm -hmm. resources, and I actually think I can handle it, and it's going to be a good dog tag. And so I always, whenever I feel why me, I always say, why not me? Yeah, that's a healthy attitude to yeah. have. Yeah, and, and actually, it does come at born of what I've been through, I, and it's not bullshit. Like I really do feel that way. I always imagine who is the person I'm giving the spot to, yeah, and think like, why am I condemning them to having one testicle? They might have a much harder time with it than you and I apparently. To make you making fun of my testicle, which is you know. I wasn't but making fun of it. I had like this a creative a, suggestion. Yeah, it was you know? to put my little light. <laughs> Did you find it? You're possibly thinking of water chestnut. I think so. Let's is pull that image up and see, Michael. What's it? Is there a technical name for there it? There we go. Water yeah, chestnut. Yeah, water chestnut. I mean, I don't know what the. That's the, that's what Chat GPT said would. Well, be let me ask you this. Can you just type? Can you type in the uh, L Y C H E E or something like like just uh, L Y C H E like no, yeah lychee fruit. What's that? Chief fruit. Let's see. Hey, oh yeah. Kind of. Here's the, here's the true litmus test, Michael. Yes. When you think of a water chestnut, <laughs> does your mouth salivate? Uh, yes. Okay, then that's what it is. He's thinking of balls. That's the closest <laughs> thing. To you know, I feel like this whole podcast is fucked up. All right. You know what? I want to reframe all this. I actually don't know if I'm comfortable with that. Michael either. and I have a fantastic working relationship, and then we are violent with each other at jujitsu every day. It's amazing. Indeed. You know, out of respect, neither of you have even asked me which one. <sighs> I mean, I maybe guess. I just want to, but now I want to, I want to, yeah. I just want to showcase. That's a way, that's a personal question. Been. That's just, oh, that's bridge too far. Oh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> that one is crossing I don't want to pull the veil back and like cross this line. <laughs> thank yeah. you for having some respect, my dignity. <laughs> what, uh, what else do you have left that you want to accomplish in your life? Like what's, what lights the fire for you? The, so, um, the, what would be fire would be the, the hottest. Yeah. I was gonna say the brightest, but that would be a candle, I guess. I love getting the word out on the book, and I love those interactions of people feeling like I gave them the courage to transcend. I am very passionate about um, human rights subjugation. I have had the um, I've had the fortune of of having two private audiences with Pope Francis in the last year. No shit. Yeah, yeah, it's crazy. I actually um, there's a campaign to raise a hundred million dollars for migrants and refugees, uh, and so support nuns who are on the front lines of all these terrible places um, and. They wanted somebody to announce the effort, and I announced it at Central Park in front of 60,000 people in wow. this huge concert that was televised all around the world. And then they invited me to meet Pope Francis. Over at the Vatican? Over at the Vatican. How so wild was that? Wild. I mean, wild. And I'm not a particularly good Catholic. So then I felt a little bit like a hypocrite. Yeah. So I said, can I give confession to somebody? <laughs> like I, I, was, I would like to give my confession directly to the Pope. I did. I did. So, so seriously, I was like, <laughs> can you send somebody who's like, three steps removed from God, you know, like if you, uh, and then I had, I tell the story in my book, I actually met in lower, lower Manhattan, Lower East Side with uh, Father Leonir, who runs a Scalabrini order. And they're the ones who help all the migrants and refugees around the world. And we had the most amazing three hour session where it's like, cause you're talking to thousands of years of accumulative wisdom. They all have multiple PhDs. Yeah. It was the most incredible session unburdening myself. I'm like, all right, here's another thing. Like, I don't really agree with you know this, that, and then um, just incredible. And then I uh, got to meet with Pope Francis. And so 
setting aside politics around migrants and refugees and how to, and the practical problems that are created, I always see, when I see people who are fleeing, I don't ask, like, why are you coming here? I always think, what are you running from? Yeah. What could be so bad that you'd have to flee? And two, what kind of character do you have to be able to deal with that strife and try to give your kids a better life? So when I have had the uh, luck of, not luck, fortune of meeting these people at different places around the world, I'm always amazed like by their stories, like heroic. So what's next for me? I don't know. Using my platform, hopefully, to shine a light on things like that. I don't really have a clear vision anymore about professionally. Yeah, It's really just, what am I going to do with my authority? I look at Elon Musk, and I'm like, you sit on top of the greatest platform ever created, and you're the richest man in the world, and you talk about Dogecoin. Like, I'm 38% sure he's actually an alien. I do, too. But it just seems like such a waste, doesn't it? Like, Unless he's just so <sighs> out there. What's his net worth? Like three hundred billion? Yeah, it's like a hundred and sixty-seven billion as of this morning. No, I'm just kidding. I don't know. That's a lot of fucking commas. Yeah. So I don't know. I I, I think perf I, I think uh, mostly I'm focused on getting the book out and then uh, figuring out what I'm gonna do with this platform. Where can people find your book? What's the best way for them to actually get a hold of this book? The book is on Amazon. Burn the boats. I also have a website. Real good job. Yeah. Thank you. Thank Bezos you. Bezos out. Exactly. Sorry. <laughs> it's the most efficient. Bezos. Yeah. yeah. I also have a website called Burn the Boats Book. I did something you'd appreciate with AI. I had fun. I thought uh, everyone is always like, "What's your next book?" I'm like, "Why has there got to be a next book?" Uh, I, my book provokes a reaction in a lot of people, reflexively, like it's risky. Burn mm -hmm. the boats. So I created a um, a, a chat pot around I trained the bot on the book but also on every study ever used around the topic and on every um, historical example going back to Sun Tzu and the Old Testament and every interview I've ever given including this one so that any time anybody could ask questions and, and day and night that's awesome isn't that awesome yeah yeah, yeah. so burn the boats book, uh, dot com. I just started I think every author will do this I yeah. just uh, I love tinkering and so I came up with this idea do you do social media at all I do yeah, I'm on Instagram. What's I'm your on handle? LinkedIn. It's M Higgins, and I'm on LinkedIn a lot. Instagram is your place, right? Uh, if I'm being honest, I don't know what people use LinkedIn for. Yeah, I have an account, but I'm not exactly sure what that platform no. is for. <laughs> no, you're you're missing it. What what should I be using it for though? You well, number one, it's the most viral of all the platforms. Yep. Shut the fuck up. I swear to God. Uh, LinkedIn is the most effective way to reach people. Now, a certain demographic, but it is the only platform that's still viral. So you could publish something that is amazing, a clip. I you think I used to, I think, oh, you know what? So I host on, so a podcast, like we'll record this and then it has to get uploaded to a server that then that, or not, well, I guess it would be a server and a service. You can attach a lot of destinations to it. I think the LinkedIn one broke and I didn't fix it. All right, well, so, so, let me, so let's put it like this, okay? Instagram is your dessert. LinkedIn is your vegetables. So I think you got to uh, eat your like vegetables. Like broccoli? Or like what are we talking about? Yeah, like things that are antioxidants because you don't want right. to be inflamed, right? Water chestnuts. Uh, yeah, water. <laughs> my, my, my wife Sarah's later is going to be like, you, it was this. Like, I can't believe we all got it wrong. It, they float in jars, yeah. okay? All right. Well, anyway, back to LinkedIn. Things still go viral. And it, uh, but you and I will work together. We'll reconvene okay. in like a year later as you built this audience yep. on LinkedIn and, and, and we'll hack it together. I mean, I have an account, like I said. I th and I think I was auto-publishing. Maybe I'll start with just reactivating the link to LinkedIn from Libsyn, which think, is the service I, I think we could do a little better. I mean, we Didn't we just <sighs> declare an intention to have Bush on the podcast? We and did. 18, so we could do LinkedIn. All right. Yeah. So that's... I feel like that's a barrier to entry that, again, I would have to try to trip over to not... <laughs> yes, <laughs> exactly. Considering that currently I'm doing zero on there... My first few moves are going to be thousands of percentiles on return. We're going to yeah, we're going to we're going we're to make some big jumps. No, we're going to get it done. But that's uh that's where my book is. Amazon. What do you want to close with, man? It's been two and a half, two hours, forty minutes. Really? What was yeah. the what was the record? Uh, Probably like four and a half, I think. Yeah. Who was quite, that with? Quite long. I don't remember who it was with, but it was, it was a long one. Yeah. We've had some fucking characters come on here. <laughs> I think we covered just about everything. We covered a lot, man. Was, I think that your ability to talk about kind of what you've been through and what you've done with it, there is not that many people who are willing to do that. Like my my guiding principle on this podcast is like people on the Friday episodes often, unless I have like next Friday's is going to be uh, some people are in town. So I did like a, a group thing with them. The number of people who reach out to me with questions. I mean, I, I certainly I have more questions in my own life than answers. But the guiding principle for me is just be honest. Yeah. Just be yourself. And I'll be honest when I when I tell people I don't know. And I will 100% talk about the fuck-ups I have because that's 
the vast contents of the dossier of my life. <laughs> well, there. Well, when life brings you to your knees enough time, you realize there really is no shame, actually, and that becomes very empowering when you. There's let things go. that people are willing to talk about, and they think that they're like, "Oh man, nobody's probably ever dealt with this." And then almost everybody else on Earth is going, "Man." Yeah, that happens to me too. I just don't want to say shit about it. And we're you, we're and, defined by our similarities, not our differences. And you give them permission, which is such a gift. Well, let's close with this. Can okay. We do this? Let's close with death. Okay. The topic that I, I. Fuck yeah, we're going out on just a light <laughs> note. <laughs> yeah, I like gonna, just drifting off into the sunset. We're gonna go. We're gonna go right to that. Okay. Um, when I had cancer, testicular cancer, I I um I remember in the time between being told, you know, you're getting amputated to the time you get a diagnosis, there's a period in between where they think you, well, at least with me, they thought it was more advanced, right? And I remember I no longer had anything to think about because all my thoughts didn't hold up juxtaposed against the prospect of imminent Truly. death. And I was like, the brownstones in Brooklyn don't work anymore, the car, the promotions. And I called it zero time. And then once I you know, got the diagnosis, I'm like, okay, this is manageable. I remember missing the feeling of nothingness and when all the mundane thoughts began to creep in. And over time, I kept trying to crawl back to that state of mind at Sloan Kettering. Mm -hmm. And how do I keep death present? Why am I more peaceful when I actually think about death and mortality? That's a long way of saying I started reading up about um, uh, in Bhutan and how they think about death five times a day and they're the happiest people on earth. Why is that? And how contemplating mortality actually makes you zoom into the moment. You so value I have a, your time. So I have an app on my phone five times a day. It reminds me that I'm going to die and very different lyrical ways. It could be Socrates. It could be a poet. It's just subtle ways of always reminding me that, that um, death is ever present, and that's not a bad thing. What's and the name of this app? It's called We Croak. I have no interest in this app. I, but thought was, I, I, think, I think we could rebrand this. So you could call it like, you're fucked. Yeah, yeah, you know? it's just, it, but it, they want it to be good for <laughs> children. But I think the reason why I want to close with this is um, this is such an important insight. Most people are afraid of it, and then they live with this cloud of anxiety, and I think it's a lot of things that drive our fear is that we don't know why we're here, we don't know where we're going, and that is so fucking scary. Yeah. But when you actually embrace uh, mortality and are reminded of it, it instantly makes you peaceful because most of the things you're worried about are mundane, and they don't hold up against death. That's my point. I was like, wait a second. The stuff that I worry about every day cannot cannot survive the thought of mortality. So if I just think about mortality all the time, I can bring myself back down to earth. So my kids think I'm absolutely insane because it'll it'll you know it'll ring off. I'm like here's death again, but I've been talking about it publicly more and posting these messages and people love it. So intellectually hmm. they reject it, but actually if you just download the app or find other ways to think about mortality, it releases you and nothing holds up against the prospect that we're here for a short period of time. So I like it. It's a little heavy to go out on, isn't it? No, it's not heavy. It's not heavy at all. Am I breaking form here by? No, there's no form. Trust me, there is. Michael can tell you this. There's absolutely no there's architecture no no. to what, <laughs> okay, what I do here. This table, we're in the safety tree. This table is. We can talk <laughs> exactly. about what you want to. I mean, it might be a dark concept to think about, but what if you have to think about dark things to set yourself free so you can appreciate the light? It's true. You know, especially if the source of a lot of your pain is coming from that place that you're not dealing with it. When I mention this, other people are like, "Are you? I'm so afraid. I'm going to leave my kids behind." I'm like, "Actually, no. You'd be you'd be more present if you thought about it." Yeah, you would. You'd value every single second you had more. Right. So we croak, we croak, or the new one I'm going to do called "You're Fucked." It's coming pretty soon. Well, here's the good thing. I don't think I don't think there's anything <laughs> proprietary about this app. So I think we're going to actually. Should we do it, Michael? Michael, can you just yeah. have a Chat GPT please uh, steal all their code and mm -hmm. put it towards the "You're Fucked" app? Actually, that's actually really. <laughs> <laughs> funny. Right? Literally, those listening, within an hour of this podcast, we yep. could launch We're Fucked. You and, totally could. And, right? And we're yeah. not going to because we're good people. <laughs> and somebody else already got the, the, Michael might the corner it. on the market of <laughs> we'll death. <see. laughs> Michael's like, you have no idea. Yeah, I've got to be so rich with death. Awesome. They do. Thank you for making the time to come out here. That was a fantastic episode. Thank you so much. So yeah. fun. My pleasure.